Thank you everyone for joining us. We began this meeting at 6.30 with an executive session and now we are back in open session. This meeting is being conducted remotely via Zoom webinar per our remote policy, participation policy, BEDJA. 10 members are in attendance in the auditorium. Evelyn Abaya Issa, Diane Baum, Kira Cook, Adam Klein, Ginny Kremer, Amy Krishnamurthy, John Peterson, Angie So, Yebin Wang, and myself. Nora Shine is absent tonight. In an ongoing effort to make our meeting as secure as possible, we asked members of the public to view the meeting using Acton TV's YouTube channel found at the top of the agenda. Those who wish to comment during the meeting were asked to register 24 hours prior to the start of the meeting using the link also found at the top of the agenda. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website at actontv.org. Per our remote policy, well, no, we're not going to do this. We are all here tonight, so we will not be calling each member's name. I will just ask for a vote and we will do it that way. Um, it should be noted that with the changing guidance and lifting of the emergency order, we expect to welcome the public to our next meeting on June 10th back in the auditorium and off of Zoom. Please check the details when that agenda is posted. All right. Um, I would just note as part of my opening that Boxborough's annual town election was held on Tuesday and Adam Klein was <laughs> was reelected to his position. Yay! Uh, we also welcome Diane Lapari and um, Jen Campbell to the select board. Um, all right, we also have a recommendation to approve the ABSAF donation, so that's what we're doing first, right, Marie? Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm going to promote the um, ABSAF board members to panelists so you, um, they can speak and um, we're very excited to have them with us this evening. Um, they are ready to present a generous $10,000 donation. There's a memo in your packet that talks a little bit more about it, um, but I would like to turn it over to the ABSAF president, Jim Kirkman, to kind of tell us about ABSAF. Great. Um, thank you very much and, and good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks for, for, for uh, inviting us here this evening. Uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, I'm the, uh, the outgoing APSAP president, and I'm joined tonight by Abby Dennison and Taylor Sahajian, two students, uh, APSAP board members, as well as uh, Trish Hassam, who's the incoming APSAP uh, vice president. Uh, unfortunately, Shirley Moore, who is the incoming APSAP president, could not uh, be here this evening. So um, we're here this evening uh, as part of what is uh, an annual tradition um, that we're, we're very pleased and we're very pleased to be here. And uh, that is to make the annual ABSAF donation. Um, you know, it, it was obviously a very unusual year in, in many, many ways and that applied to ABSAF and you know our, abil our ability to fundraise as we typically do wasn't available, but we, we did want to make sure we were able to still um, raise funds and continue our annual giving uh, um, to support student activities. So I'll uh, turn it over to Taylor to, and, and Abby to talk about our donation and uh, some of the things we did this year to, to uh, fundraise. So uh, Taylor, I'll turn it to you. Hi everyone, good evening. And thank you um, for your time tonight. Um, we are here to present the ABSAF annual donation um, as you know, in support of student activities at um, RJ Gray Junior High School and the Acton Box for Regional High School. This year was very different for ABSAF, as it was for all of us, um, due to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, so our traditional primary fundraising activities, like the ABSAF pass sales and the annual ABSAF phonathon, were not options for us this year, as we couldn't sell a pass that um, provided admission to varsity games or PC productions that weren't occurring this year. Um, in addition, the phonathon was not an option as we did not feel it was appropriate to request donations from families during a pandemic. Um, however, we all believe that we still needed to do something this year to continue our mission um, of supporting extracurricular activities um, as we believe that they are vital in developing well-rounded students and also um, the activities provide a way for students to feel connected to their peers and to the school. 
And I will now turn it over to Abby Dennison, who will share what we did this year and the amount of the donation. Thank you, Taylor, and good evening, everyone. Given the lack of traditional fundraising options, we've decided to get creative and identify um, types of social distance fundraising activities. Last September, we held a mum's flower sale and sold muffin loaves from the gingerbread construction company. This spring, we sold spring pansies coupled with an ABM branded umbrella. We are proud of our 25 plus students and adult volunteers who stepped up, got creative, and ensured that ABSAF would be able to make a donation this year. We are glad to present the school committee with a $10,000 donation. We are grateful for the support of the community who has continued their support during this difficult year. Thank you for your time and we are glad to take any questions if there are any. Great, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Taylor and Abby. That was uh, very well done, and um, we're here on on behalf of the the thirty plus students and and adults who who make up ABSAF. And as uh, Taylor and Abby said, glad to take any questions. I also just want to highlight, I, I believe that you all received as part of the meeting materials tonight the ABSAF Spring Newsletter. Um, we just that's a, a newsletter that we publish three times a year that highlights the multitude of student activities that occur at RJ Gray Regional as well as the high school um, and we send that to all of our pass holders and donors every year and, and wanted to make sure that the school committee was aware and had a chance to see our, our latest newsletter. Thank you so much for that presentation, Marie. Thank you, Tessa. Um, I just wanna say it would have been really easy for ABSAF to kind of throw their arms up and say, you know what, this year there really isn't anything we can do to help, sorry. They didn't do that. They put their heads together. They came up with very creative ways to raise funds. We also spent less on activities and athletics this year. We knew last summer that um, it wasn't going to be possible to sell the ABSAF passes. And so we really preserved the majority, almost all of last year's donation to be used for next year. Um, so this $10,000 is extremely generous. It comes out of a lot of hard work. It's an incredible board. It's um, about half students, so it's really unique in that way, students and parents in the community. And I just wanna really thank you all for all that you've done and really, really going above and beyond this year. Thank you very much. We're, we're glad to be able to, to make the donation. Does anyone have any questions or comments before we vote, Diane? Uh, Diane. Adam? Yeah, uh, uh, I would just like to express my gratitude for the lovely pansies I have in front of my house. And I look forward to next year <laughs> when we can all stand around the big check, because that is my favorite part. Thank you. Thank you. Flowers look great, though, don't they? They're, they live uh, living a long life. All right, is there a motion? Move to approve with gratitude. Second. Second. I've been waiting a year and a half to do this. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. With gratitude. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. That is, uh, <laughs> that is approved unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much Great. for everything you've done. This has been awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, we do not have our student rep tonight. He'll be reporting uh, at our next meeting. So if members of the public who pre-registered would like to speak on a topic that is not listed on our agenda, would you please raise your hand so you can be recognized for up to three minutes each. I'll note that if you have comments about something that is on our agenda, you can wait until that part of the meeting um, and will be recognized after the committee has an opportunity to discuss. I'm not seeing any hands raised in the panelist or in the attendees list. All right, then we can move right into new business because we don't have any presentations tonight. So, um, Diane, that puts you up first. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah, Peter, you want to do your superintendent's update? <laughs> Tessa clearly wants to get through this meeting. Um, so I've prepared a 22-page superintendent update for you. Um, I'm gonna start off by just saying we are very excited to report to you that we have had zero cases of COVID uh, reported for students or staff members in our in-person learning program for over two weeks now. So that is absolutely fantastic news. 
So that certainly supports uh, our continued progress in starting to relax some of our safety protocols in a manner consistent with the governor and DESE's most recent updates. So we do look forward to a safe and healthy end of the school year under the new guidelines. Vaccine update, I'm also really excited to be able to give this update, but thank you to Don for putting this information together with our nurses. Um, so as you know, the COVID-19 vaccines are now available for anyone 12 years or older. Um, so as of today, we are happy to report that 291, which is 34% of our junior high school students, have received their first dose of the vaccine. We have 657, or 36% of high school students have also received their first dose of the vaccine. And in addition to that, 490, 490%, 490 or 27% of high school students have received their second dose of the vaccine. So all in all, we have now um, about 63% of high school students have had at least one dose of the vaccine. So that's fantastic uh, news. And I know appointments around the state are readily available. Uh, we are starting some discussions with our two town health departments um, about the possibility of thinking of maybe something, I don't think we need to do a clinic right now because there's such ample access, but maybe something toward, as we progress toward the start of the school year to think about um, you know, maybe the younger students, if they can come online. We're starting to hear that there might actually be a possibility that uh, vaccines could be available on the very early end, as late as, or as early as August, but I think it could also be September or October, so we just have to kind of wait and see um, how those trials go. COVID uh, protocols update. So as you're aware, the governor had a press conference um, and released um, protocols. We were pleased to be able to review those several hours after the press conference when we received them, um, <laughs> along with the questions. Um, but we were able over the last few days to review those with our two town health departments. And we have now uh, aligned all of our safety protocols with the most recent guidance from the governor and DESE. Uh, we've communicated that out to families. Um, I do want to, just because we haven't met in between that time, just to update you on some key areas of that. Um, outdoor mask use um, has been, the requirement to wear out masks outdoors has been lifted for students, regardless of distance. Um, so, you know, as we've learned from the commissioner, the governor's office has a medical advisory team. Um, that, you know, we're so fortunate to be in Massachusetts where we have some of the best medical advisors in the country. Um, and they really looked hard at the data around where cases were being transmitted and under what circumstances. And so that really is what led to the governor's recommendations to lift some of these requirements. So students are no longer required to wear masks outdoors, even if they cannot be distanced. Um, the update applies to recess, physical education, youth sports, um, and outdoor learning environments. Um, close contacts who are exposed to a COVID-19 positive individual while outdoors at recess do not have to quarantine anymore. Um, adults, however, do have to continue to wear masks even outdoors if they can't maintain that distance. Um, so if adults, you know, particularly we have a lot of our staff who have been vaccinated, if they can maintain the distance, they can certainly take their masks off outside. But if they can't maintain that six feet of distance, then they should be wearing masks still. Um, and that is on our campuses. Indoor mask use, adults and students do have to continue to wear masks at all times indoors. Um, there were also some updates around school-based athletics. Athletes on spring teams and active play outdoors are not required to wear masks uh, during play anymore. That includes when they're on the bench or in the dugout. They do not have to wear masks. Um, in low-risk sports, when athletes are indoors with a distance of 14 feet or more, um, they can be consistently maimed, are also not required to wear masks. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what sport that applies to. Um, Yep, yep, it's probably not wrestling. Um, spectators and chaperones, coaches, staff, referees, umpires, and other officials who can practice social distancing while outdoors are not required to wear masks or face coverings. Visitors, spectators, volunteers, and staff while indoors are required. So outdoors, spectators do not have to wear masks as long as they can distance, and indoors they do have to wear masks. And all athletes participating in high school sports are considered youth now under that proposed guidance. So now we're really just aligning DESE's guidance with the state guidance on athletics and DPH guidance. So that's good news. End of the year gatherings, if there are outdoor gatherings, the 
size limits for outside participants are lifted on May 29th, which is consistent with state guidance um, for other gatherings. However, we do have to follow, you know, other guidance in the supplemental safety measures. So we have that information available for all of our school leaders to be able to communicate as they have gatherings. And then graduation update. Um, the state, two weeks before high school graduation, amended its guidance. Um, not that graduation ceremonies aren't planned six months in advance, um, but our team has done a really nice job reviewing that. You know, we have to take into account not only the state guidance, but also the size of our graduating class, you know, what that means in terms of the number of guests and the relative safety of different things we do. So we do have some updates for everyone. Um, masks will be optional. Um, so effective May 29th, for outdoor graduations only, attendees and staff are not required to wear masks. Attendees and staff not vaccinated, however, are still encouraged to wear masks. Students will walk to receive their diplomas up to the stage, which is really exciting news. Um, the photographer, videographer will capture the diploma uh, handoff. It will appear on the two larger screens. We have two LED screens uh, rented for this uh, because we didn't know what things would look like a few months ago when we had to put the deposit down. So that will be an exciting addition to this year's commencement. Um, and we'll have all of the photos and everything else available on um, our graduation website. We cannot do handshakes still. So that's handshakes are still out. Um, we originally had required staggered alumni, uh, oh, excuse me, staggered arrival and check-in procedures. Those are no longer required. However, we are asking for just crowd control purposes to have uh, guests still use the designated gate. Things that still will remain in effect uh, due to the current guidance include we had, had, we had developed pods of seating on the field um, so that guests uh, would actually sit with the graduates um, in a pod of the graduate plus six guests and all pods are six feet from each other. We still think based on the number of graduates we have and the number of guests that that means um, in attendance, that's probably still the safest bet. Um, and knowing that we have very different beliefs and concerns about transmission of virus, we don't know who's vaccinated from you know, the general public and guests. And in all honesty, we actually think it, for this case, it makes for a bit more of an inclusive commencement ceremony um, because you know, prior to that, um, right now all six guests get to sit with a front row seat to what's going on. Prior to that, only two guests could sit down on the bleacher side and everyone else was just up on the hill, um, kind of on a first come first serve basis. So we didn't know what plans people had made. We decided to just stick with kind of what we had published and that's, that's the plan moving forward. Uh, gate entry and parking does remain in effect uh, just for crowd control purposes. So we're excited about some of the relaxation of those guidelines. Um, I also, I know you saw this, but we did send out a notice that um, we were able to look at some attrition in the district offices um, from a budgetary standpoint. And after a couple of years of looking at some of the needs that we have across the district, a couple of areas that stood out to us, um, one was around kind of thinking more broadly around how we communicate with our community. Um, and the other was thinking about how we can use data to drive improvement, not only at the district level um, in a macro sense, but thinking about student learning data and how we can best equip our teachers to work with student data in classrooms and provide the data to them in a way that's useful without a lot of extra work on the part of teachers. And so based on some of those needs and some of the opportunities available through attrition, we created a position called Director of Special Projects. And I'm pleased to announce that Andrew Shen, who is the principal of RJ Gray, is going to be moving into the district uh, offices in that position. We are really, really excited um, to welcome Andrew to that. We sent his bio out. Um, he is a very, very skilled administrator. Um, outstanding communicator, very deep thinker in terms of how to move things forward strategically and we're just so excited to be able to add him into the district offices. Um, I will say that we'll leave a hole at RJ Gray. However, we're fortunate that one of his assistant principals, uh, Jim Marcotte, who has been absolutely outstanding um, in working with Andrew for the past just about a decade um, in helping to lead RJ Gray, um, has agreed to serve in an interim capacity. We didn't believe that trying to run a full junior high school principal search in May and June was going to provide, prove effective and we have a lot of confidence in Jim's leadership to be able to step up into those shoes and the relationship that Jim and Andrew have will allow for a smooth transition as well as we progress through the year. So uh, we're really excited to have Andrew at the district level and think he's gonna bring um, 
you know, a lot of um, expertise and thinking into what we're doing. And then I am also, I want to credit Don with a lot of leadership over this last event along with AB Cares. Uh, but there was a Safer Home, Safer Community event. Um, and the, it was essentially a, a gun buyback. And I'll be clear, this has nothing to do with Second Amendment rights. Uh, what we do know is gun violence is um, closely tied with mental health as well. And so the buyback event was, um, we had 34 unwanted or unused firearms that were collected for destruction. So that was absolutely tremendous. So Don, thank you so much for all you did to help get that, get that moving forward, as well as all of AB Cares. So with that said, I think that's the end of my update for the night. John? Well, in New England, there's a famous saying that if you don't like the weather, it will change. And of course, <laughs> That's been very much, I think, the mantra of the school district this year. And so I was really pleased um, to hear about your quick adjustments for the graduation ceremony, which is, is so critical to everyone in light of the changing guidance. And I, you know, I think for people who missed your mention of it, it's really hard to swing at the pitch when they don't let you swing till the ball is in the catcher's net, which seems to have happened over and over again in terms of state regulation. So, um, you know, I, it's been hard. You know, I do hope also in the spirit of, you know, future activities that people will reflect on this ability to make quick decisions and change and believe that we can do that again, you know, when circumstances mean that that's appropriate. John, if you would like to read the thing that you prepared now, you can. Yeah, I, and, and I, I have a statement that I also would like um, to read. The Acton Box for a Regional School District has been fortunate to have uh, Asian representation and voices on our school committee for most of the past decade. We must hear our member Asian voices, respect their experience, and be responsive to their needs, as well as the needs and aspirations of the community they represent. Cars are an important part of the American experience, and for many Americans, the best car is a truck, in particular an F-150 a product line with sales of $42 billion in 2019. Who did Ford choose to lead the program that launched the F-150 Lightning? Linda Zhang, an Asian American who came to the US as a child, is the chief nameplate engineer for the vehicle which is critical to Ford's future. May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. While it is not surprising that many people have not heard of Linda Zhang, it was shocking to hear that 42% of Americans cannot name a well-known Asian American according to a recent survey. Here in Boston, people could have named I.M. Pei, architect of the John F. Kennedy Library, or Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist. If you're a chemist like me, you might have thought of Roger Sen, winner of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work with green fluorescent proteins. I did not realize that Maya Ying Lin won the design competition for the Vietnam Memorial as a student at Yale, a competition she believed she only won because the submissions were blinded. And why did so few call out the names of Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, or Vivek Murthy, once again, the US Surgeon General? These important people should all be recognized and celebrated. On the other hand, Asian Americans continue to be targeted. The federal government is responding. The House passed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, um, which will expedite the Justice Department's review of hate crimes and designate an official at the department to oversee the effort. President Biden signed the bill this afternoon. As a school community, we face the same challenges that America does. To properly recognize and celebrate our large and diverse Asian American membership and to provide a safe and supportive environment in which we can all learn and grow together. Thanks, John. Yes, Angie. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, John, for the, uh, for the statement. And I, this month is the Asian Heritage Month, which is May. And I took a quick look at it. And I think President Carter started in 19, in, in the years when he was president. Then, President Bush and become become make that May of month, May the whole month the uh, Asian heritage. So I just want to say that I'm just so happy that I'm so proud to be Asian and I'm so happy to, happy with all the Asian 
heritage and with all the cultures that we bring to the land that we are happy that we can contribute to this country and contribute to the community. And I think no matter which ethnic background that you have, and we all have different diversity, we all have different uniqueness, just I really think that we are, actually there's another number that I look at it, which is in the current con Congress, in the uh, congressman that there is 15 um, Pacific Islander and Asian American in-house. So I kind of want to encourage AB students, come on, that you can, <laughs> Asian student, you can win a seat there, that we, we need boost up the population, the percentage there. Thank you. Evelyn. Uh, happy Asian Heritage Month to Angie and Yiban and to the rest of our district students. So, Peter, I had a question about um, the vaccine, uh, vaccinated numbers that you gave. How are we collecting that for students? I'll let Don speak to that, but that comes in through the state. Yes, yeah, so we have um, a direct, uh, we can download information from the, the Massachusetts Immunization Information System um, that where all of that information is, is input. So do students indicate which school district they are when they, or um, is it by zip code? It's actually by unique identifiers that oh. are assigned by the state. Oh, okay. Confused because, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm confused too. Because I, I asked because I, I enrolled my daughter, she just got her vaccine, but the information that I inputted did not have any identifier other than like when we look at referrals, we look at it by zip code and by age. So that could be the unique identifier, but I don't know if that's what. It's know. probably a combination of address, name, and age, and somehow they sync it with our system and they find matches. It's, it's similar to the system that we use to download information about students who would be eligible for free and reduced lunch as well. Got it, thank you. Okay, so now we can go on to the next part of the agenda that I was going to go to. Skip right over, Peter. You can see, now we're 20 minutes behind. If I had just skipped your update, then we would be right on time. All right, Diane, would you like to speak to policy? Absolutely. You haven't seen policy for a while. We've been hard at work. We've been engaging stakeholders and, and building policies really from the ground up. Um, I'm bringing tonight two policies and seeking your feedback for a first read. One is um, policy IL, evaluation of instructional programs. And uh, the other is DDA, which we are renaming KCD, public gifts to schools. And that's because if you look in the National School Board Association index, um, that policy is, is really should be a K, um, under KCD, section K. So we're just, we're just gonna move it to that section. Um, so I'll first speak to um, IL, Evaluation of Instructional Program. So here's what you need to know about this policy. First of all, there's no legal basis for it, and there are already required mechanisms in place for program evaluation in school districts. And that is what is meant by the statement at the end of paragraph one, that school improvement is enhanced when communities develop accountability provisions on their own to complement and augment state and federal policies. So I wanna spend just a second unpacking what is meant by the state and federal policies. Some of the things that um, we must do, they're mandated, are give MCAS, which informs program evaluation. The access test for English language learners influences that as well. There's another um, group that comes in from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, that's called a tiered focus monitoring that ensures that districts are compliant with special education and civil rights requirements to support student outcomes. Um, and then you know, last night I, as a liaison to CPAC, I attended their meeting and they had this on the agenda. And, and I wanted to just point out that according to Mass General Law, uh, chapter 71B, um, the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, is authorized to provide advice to the district regarding special education programs and policies. I'm reading that right out of the law. And they are authorized to meet with school officials and engage in activities which enable them to participate in the planning, development, and evaluation of special education programming. So that's just, those are the mandated things. And 
One of the voluntary things um, is the, the NEASC. It's an accrediting body called the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And they come into the high school and they do kind of a review of systems so that the staff there can reflect on how their policies and their practices align with qualitative standards like school culture and student learning and professional practice and there, there's more. So I just, I wanted to spend a little time because all of that <laughs> is encapsulated in that paragraph one. That is what is meant by augmenting. This is what we're augmenting. So um, I think, I thought it was worth just a couple of seconds or like the minute it took to go through that. So here's what we intend um, to do with this policy and I'd love your feedback on it tonight. The policy speaks to the belief that the greatest power for continuous improvement in educational systems lives at the local level with accountability provisions that complement and like I said, augment state and federal programs and policies. That was important to policy sub. It was also important to policy sub to bring you a policy that embeds equity as the central piece of improvement work and as a lens to understand data, it kind of puts like a mirror to ourselves as a district to drive continuous improvement. And finally, it calls for metrics and accountability and transparency uh, without tying the hands of leadership to specific indicators which may change over time. So with that is kind of, that's my quick uh, overview of what the intention was behind the policy and um, we're, I'm happy to take your feedback at this time. Angie? I think I'm gonna ask a question later, but can you elaborate when you, when you just mentioned the, the equity behind the policy, how this equity is defined and elaborate? Thank you. Let me just get the policy up. Okay. So everything we do, um, everything policy, the policy subcommittee did this year, we, we, look, we tried to look at through an equity lens. So if, so you have, I think we're gonna probably be talking about equity later on in the school committee meeting, but if equity means that student, not everybody gets the same thing, but students are getting what they need, that this, this policy attempts to look at disparities in outcomes in order to determine what needs to be done to move the district forward con for continuous improvement. And embedded in that is the idea that students are going to be getting what they need and this is a mechanism to identify that so that there can be more equity in educational delivery and in outcomes. Does that help? Can I? Yeah. So it's look at more like a, from the result. You look at the result, then you look at the process coming back. It's like reverse engineering. Well, it's certainly circular. You know, they, the, the outcomes inform the process and you know, around and around we go. And you know, if you believe in, in, a, in a growth model, um, that, that cycle never ends. There's always room for continuous improvement. Yeah, I think this is going to become a discussion, which is every student is unique. How we look at the result, be able to um, to, to to see how how we identify the uniqueness of each student. Yeah, we can actually. Uh, so the, I have a a little bit in a later presentation on the strategy that speaks right to that. So happy to maybe talk about that more then. Okay, great. Yeah, sure. I, I don't want to take too much of time. Yep. Yeah. John? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to focus on the, um, the local metrics and assessments and, and it just sort of reemphasize the point that um, it, it is important to have those things in addition to, you know, other, you know, state and federal things. Um, and particularly to note that while the policy says that the requirement is that they be reported out annually. You know, I would hope that whenever there are opportunities, not only to talk about what we are doing, but talk about outcomes and uh, the results of assessments, that that would come to the school committee, um, again, with a focus on making it accessible, not only to the school committee, but to the general public, 
so that it's understandable, you know, why we think we're making progress. Unless there are other questions now, Diane, we'll always welcome feedback by email um, ahead of the next policy subcommittee meeting. Um, all right, you want to move on to the next one? Sure. Uh, the second policy is um, DDA, which um, I just mentioned that we are now renaming KCD. This is public gifts to schools. So in considering this policy, I've actually been thinking a lot um, about this phrase with gratitude um, that, we, that we say and just said. <laughs> and I was thinking actually this morning, this visual came in my mind of, of um, Je the, the game Jeopardy. And if the category was donations for 500, the question would be, um, what is a phrase every Acton Borough school, school committee member says when voting on a gift mm -hmm. or a donation? <laughs> so seriously, though, with gratitude, really does capture our deep appreciation of the work and the generosity of private organizations to enrich our public educational experience of our students. So it's, it's a wonderful thing that organizations want to support our students and enrich their experience during the 13 years that they are in school here. So it, it, it was with some sense of consternation as a policy subcommittee as we re-envisioned this policy um, because it circumscribes the targets that 501c3s like PTOs and other private organizations can donate to our schools. Um, but it was really actually empowering in the end as we struggled to find the right words to encode the idea that equity requires aligning systems with community needs. And, what is, and so the question of what is the tipping point where an enrichment program or an activity becomes an equity issue is, is it's kind of required conversation for all stakeholders both public and private, and I hope that the policy captured that, that this is not just a, um, a top-down directive, um, but it's, it's a quest for everybody to engage in the equity work, and that's messy, and that's, it's hard conversations, but it's really necessary. So again, I'll, I'm happy to take feedback and questions. Crickets. Um, I will just say that this this is something that um, you know, Diane and I, as part of the um, joint PTSO roundtable, have been working on for years in talking to um, the different PTOs about about this. And um, you know, I think that 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 a lot of work has gone into this, and a lot of thought has gone into this, and we did float this to the PTO chairs um, ahead of this meeting. I can just speak to the process um, real quick. So this policy in particular will go back to the, we'll take input and we're gonna go back to the, the PTSO round table with a final draft, get your feedback as well, and then we'll come back to you for a second read. So we'll see you again in June on this one. And I'll just say that there was a lot of feedback and a lot of questions and a lot of things that hadn't been considered, especially with regards to procedures and whatnot when we did float this to the, when, when Diane was able to come to the joint PTO meeting and, and share some of this. Adam? Yeah, I just, I, I want to comment that I, I really appreciate the work that was done here to lay some uh, very clear um, expectations around how the donations of funds work. You know, I, I, I sort of liken this to um, setting rules for your kids, right? You love your kids, you want them to succeed, but you have to set clear rules for them to get that way. And I think what we've set here is we, we love the donations, we welcome them, we want them to go to uh, purposes that um, equitably affect or, or provide equitable enrichment for all of our students, and here are some of the guidelines that provide that. And I think by bringing that up to a school committee policy level, it really, um, lightens the load, I would say, on some of the more downstream administration and PTO organizations to just say, here, here are the rules for you to play by. We know that you're going to be, you know, we're giving you some great guidance so that you can continue to do the great work that you're doing and, and not sort of struggle with, with decisions. So I, again, I, I applaud the, the policy subcommittee and I thank them for their time on this. This is really great. Okay, well, that certainly took less than the 40 minutes we had allotted for it. So thank you, Diane, for being so concise and for bringing um, such clear information and, and doing such great work um, for, to the entire policy subcommittee um, on, on two policies, which 
you know, are aligned with what we've decided as school committee to focus on, as you said, the equity lens. So thank you. And again, if anybody has additional um, feedback, uh, either from the community or from the school committee that they'd like to submit to Diane, then send that along. Can I just ask Beth for a little um, help here on the next date for the net, which I forgot to write down. What is the date of the next policy subcommittee meeting? Friday the 28th. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Okay. So, Peter, you're up next. All right. Thank you, Tessa. So, um, some of this brief presentation you saw two weeks ago at the school committee workshop, but um, we did receive some comments coming into the school committee shell over the course of the school day with some questions um, around what is the definition of equity, what is kind of the difference between equity and this notion of equality, um, among some other questions on the strategy. So we have worked uh, over the course of the day to, as we've seen some of the questions come in, try and incorporate some of those questions um, into the presentation to try and answer them to the extent possible um, in about a three hour turnaround. So um, keep that in mind as we go. But as a reminder, and again, you saw this before, but um, in 2017 was the last time the school committee adopted a long range strategic plan. Um, and that plan articulated the mission vision values of the district, which remain to this day. It also articulated three overarching goals, um, which were to understand and respond to our students' social emotional needs, that our students will have equitable opportunities and tools to learn, and our students will have access to safe and effective learning environments. So those were the three goals that the district operated on at the time. Um, and what we did for improvement processes is the district offices would set annual goals based on kind of those overarching areas, uh, but there wasn't necessarily a long range plan to address each of those over time. Um, so, you know, the following year, uh, right after that plan was adopted, you hired me, um, or some of you hired me. Um, and, you know, through the first six months on the job, I conducted kind of an entry process. Um, and I developed a report of entry findings and it's linked here and I know you've reviewed it recently as well uh, in preparation for the workshop last week so I won't go into that but there were kind of six overarching themes that emerged out of that and I'm not going to go into each of them tonight um, but they're here on the slide and you know people in our community can go back and look at that report of entry findings in order to arrive at that report of entry findings I, you know, certainly looked at district-wide data around how we were performing, um, who we were serving, who we maybe were underserving uh, in our schools. I also had an opportunity to meet with a variety of stakeholder groups in the community. Um, I probably ended up meeting with something on the order of 250 to 300 different people across the district over time in small groups, individual meetings, um, and really just listening and learning about the district's values, about the work of the district, went into informing that report of entry findings. Through the report of entry findings and the six areas that I had identified, there were a number of subtopics. And so we did the same activity with our leadership team and our um, in the school committee where for all of the subtopics we actually went through a process to um, using a kind of a nominal group technique to have school committee members and leaders in the district identify the areas that were the highest priority you know we can't do everything in a, in a strategic plan and any strategic plan that tries to do everything and do everything to make everyone happy that would want to be happy actually isn't a strategy anymore uh, because you're not focused and so the goal of that activity was to really narrow down and get everyone's input into, of all the things we've heard through my entry process and I learned, what are the key areas that we want to use to improve our district? And so that process evolved from about June through October of 2019. Um, and simultaneously, we also looked at the leadership team and we looked at kind of the mission, vision, values. We chose to leave those the same as in the prior process because they were relatively new in 2017 and the community was just starting to understand the core values of the district around wellness, equity, and engagement and we chose not to change them 
because they were still relevant to what we were trying to do. We were just expanding in a little bit further in some of the directions the district had already started to go. We worked with the leadership team because we felt like there was a gap in between what you would refer to as kind of core values and how you would then implement a strategy and something needed to be done. And so we talked a lot about our own team's beliefs and the belief systems at play and the beliefs that we thought we needed to have and articulate in order to move the strategy forward. So we ended up developing a statement of our beliefs. And then as we were thinking about adopting the overarching strategy, the pandemic happened and we shut down um, and we necessarily had to put this work on pause. Um, in hindsight, it actually gave us a real opportunity to learn about ourselves, take a pause, and I think coming out of the pandemic, our priorities, well, overall they haven't changed. Some of what we choose to tackle first certainly has changed because of the pandemic, and we need to think about what we've learned during the pandemic to inform what the priorities are of our district moving forward. And that's something that we talked about at length in that school committee workshop a couple of weeks ago. So we didn't completely stop, we just slowed down. And from March of 2020 to March of 2021, um, we had to deal with the pandemic and all of the impact that that had on just about every aspect of our operation. But during that time, we did have an opportunity to reach out to the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, who had actually just completed some data training uh, with our leadership team over the last few years. And we asked them to take a look at our strategy and help us think uh, more deeply about that and so they gave us some feedback we revised the strategy again and this continued to be a living document throughout that time this year in april we actually brought this strategy to our dei family advisory group and we asked them to provide us additional feedback about that from a family lens and what that means to them um, and so they gave us a couple of really good comments uh, particularly around the incorporation of curriculum and making sure curriculum was clearly articulated in some of our work around inclusive cultures um, so you'll see that reflected in the updated version and then um, in early may may 6th we brought that to you in a workshop format and got more feedback from the school committee um, and we've since made revisions to that and we're bringing it back to you for adoption. Just to highlight, you know, this is not a new document um, and it's not a new concept for us. This is work that's been in process for three years. Uh, the first year was around the entry process and identifying key priority areas. And then since then, we've seen this in multiple formats. Uh, we had, you know, throughout the year, um, of 2019-2020. We had multiple public discussions about this. We actually set our district goals around the draft version of the strategy um, as we were thinking about my goals and the district goals. And that's something that had multiple reads through school committee meetings. Um, and in addition, we actually published an overview of this work um, in the four key priority areas in all of the information that we handed out at town meeting um, in June of 2020. So we really tried to start getting bits of information out as we had them so that people were becoming aware of what we were doing. This past year, um, this certainly was the basis. We actually had three reads of my goals this year, which were all based on the strategy. Um, so we had lots of discussions about that. It was published at the time, discussed within the committee. Um, and then, you know, we had the workshop in May and then we're coming back to it tonight asking for your approval of that. The mission, as I said before, mission, vision, values have not changed, but the mission is to provide high quality educational opportunities to inspire a community of learners. Our vision is to develop engaged, well-balanced learners through collaborative, caring relationships. And then our core values are engagement and providing engaging ep educational opportunities where students develop passion and joy for learning. Equity, we ensure all students have equitable access to programs and curricula to reach their potential and wellness, we partner with families to prioritize social emotional wellness, which is necessary for learning and developing resilience. We also want to share with you briefly the belief statements that our leadership team had. So we do believe that every student has the right to be loved, valued, challenged, and supported by the adults across our school community. And that's every student has those rights. Uh, learning must be meaningfully engaging for every student. Each educator is responsible for every student's learning and social emotional well-being and every ABRSD employee contributes to the social, emotional and intellectual growth of students, all students, every day. By building relationships and trust with students, 
families, colleagues, it's safe to make mistakes and learn from others. And finally, student characteristics inclu uh, that include race, socioeconomic status, disability, ethnicity, or any other part of their identity should not be an indicator of access or their outcomes. And the language we use to talk about students and families shapes the culture of our schools and our district. So we arrived at four overarching objectives. Um, and you can think of objectives as goals, but they're really targets. Um, and so one objective is around engaged learning, and that's to improve the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional engagement in learning by increasing the variety and relevance of learning experiences. Inclusive practices are to ensure that all students, staff, and families feel welcomed and included by strengthening school climate and culture and intentionally implementing culturally responsive instructional practices and materials. Equitable opportunities and outcomes, ensuring that every student has access to equitable opportunities and outcomes, regardless of gender, socioeconomic status, race, disability, gender identity, or other differentiating characteristics. And in social emotional learning, improving social emotional development through an aligned continuum of skills, instruction, and support for students pre-K through 12. So I'm not going to read every single one of these, um, but I'll hit on an overarching idea uh, just to begin discussing this. And I've highlighted some key terms that I'll, I'll discuss um, on the next slide. But overarching in this, one of the things that I learned coming into the district is we had a lot of different beliefs and perspectives on what a good education should look like here at Acton and Boxborough. And at the time, that was causing a lot of tension within our community around, at the time, I think the school committee had recently adopted a homework policy. Um, and, you know, some of you may remember come some of the scars coming out of the homework policy and the implementation of that. And it really hit on some differing beliefs about what education should look like for students. And so I think, you know, now is just as appropriate of a time to try and have a process that can bring our community and our stakeholders together to actually talk about what do we have in terms of shared values that can unify a vision around what great education should look like for our students and what types of skills and competencies our students should have as they leave our school system. We certainly have always valued a high degree of content expertise and we will certainly always value a high degree of content expertise. But there are many, many other types of skills um, like critical thinking that we probably want our students to have, the ability to analyze problems um, effectively and move forward. I'm just naming some possible examples, but I think that's something our whole community should be able to engage in and have input into the types of outcomes we want for our students through the district. That then informs most of these other categories, um, and we've had a multi-year initiative around implementing additional STEAM opportunities for students. I do want to talk about what engagement looks like and what it means, uh, because I do think it's important that we have a little bit of a shared understanding. I can't define every term tonight for everyone, but some key terms. Cognitive engagement, and this is right out of, there's a book by uh, Boykin and Nogueira that is on the, uh, from the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. Um, so it defines cognitive engagement as investment aimed at comprehending complex concepts and issues and acquiring difficult skills. It conveys deep, rather than surface level, processing of information whereby students gain critical or higher order understanding of the subject matter and solve challenging problems. So that's this notion of cognitive engagement that we want to increase. Emotional engagement is the affective side of engagement, and it connotes emotional reactions linked to task investment. The greater the student's interest level, positive effect, positive attitude, positive value held, curiosity and task absorption, and the less anxiety, sadness, stress, and boredom. Um, is optimal for student learning. In terms of behavioral engagement, it's really the presence of what we sometimes refer to as on-task behavior, but I think it's deeper than that. And so that entails effort, persistence, um, along with things like paying attention, asking pointed questions, seeking help when needed, um, that enables people to accomplish tasks at hand. So when we talk about this idea of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral engagement, we're really thinking of engagement as a complex concept. Uh, that we want to continue to improve with our students. If you were on the committee a few years ago, you saw some challenge success data, um, and they've started to look and measure student engagement levels based on survey responses. And what came back to us is this striking notion that we had a lot of students, and they called the term doing school, which is where they're compliant and they're behaviorally engaged, but they're not emotionally engaged. They're not necessarily excited about the types of work they're doing. Um, and not all of our students have been cognitively engaged at a level that challenges each and every student. 
Um, so that's certainly something that I think we can improve and think about, and that was the genesis of this overarching objective around engagement. Inclusive practice, um, this is really about making sure that each and every member of our school community feels welcomed when they come here. And this is certainly something that's been um, forefront this year, I think, as we've talked about issues of race, as we've talked about issues of bias in our schools. Um, and it's going to be a challenging concept to continue to work through with our community because there's an awful lot of lenses to, to community beliefs and student beliefs and staff beliefs that we want to continue to unpack. But one of the key items I want to dig into is around culturally responsive practice, just to make sure that we have some type of a common definition of that. So culturally responsive teaching is an element of practice, um, and it's a pedagogy that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural references in all aspects of their learning. So we need our students to see themselves reflected in the learning that they do. Um, and we need their cultures to be reflected in the learning that they do. Um, and so I've just listed some of the aspects of culturally responsive teaching. And this is off of uh, the website for Brown University and their Education Alliance. Equitable opportunities and outcomes. Um, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, but a lot of this is around looking at who we have not served as well as we needed to over time and addressing some of those equity gaps. Um, you could arguably make a case that there's equity gaps in every single aspect of our district operations, and there are. But again, we need to be strategic about key areas. We know that early literacy is the gateway to all learning that students do in schooling. Um, and we need to make sure that our students have great access to high quality early literacy instruction. We also know that eighth grade mathematics is a very, very strong indicator of access to upper level coursework at a high school. And so there are some key indicators in the educational research that point us to making sure that even though we want all aspects of our school programming to be equitable, we do have to focus on some. We also know that from a social emotional learning perspective, we want equity. Um, and we want all students to feel welcome, but develop um, social emotional skills and have access to those resources that allow them to do that. Um, I do want to talk about equitable opportunities and outcomes. And so I want to talk healthcare for a minute. The World Health Organization uh, defines equity in health as the absence of avoidable or remediable differences. And I added that emphasis because I wanted to call that. That, that. Those are important words in this. Among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically. Health inequities, and you could substitute the word educational inequities anywhere here, therefore involve more than inequality with respect to health determinants, access to resources needed to provide uh, excuse me, to improve and maintain health or health outcomes, they also entail a failure to avoid or overcome inequalities that infringe on fairness and human rights norms. I actually think that's a great working definition of equity in a lot of regards. Um, and I wanted to come to that definition of equity because I think it has a lot of implications for how we think about education. Um, you know, the working definition of equity that I'd like to posit for right now is equity does not mean that all students will have the same outcomes. It means that all students should have access to programs, curricula, supports, and interventions designed to eliminate predictable, avoidable, or remediable differences. That's our goal with equity. If we can predict the outcome of a student based on their gender, the color of their skin, or some other differentiating characteristic, we have a problem we need to solve as a school district. We should not be able to predict student outcomes based on external factors that could be avoided. Why do we talk about outcomes? Well, if I said we want to improve math instruction, we would, of course, say, well, how do students perform? We can't talk about equity unless we talk about student outcomes. It's impossible because we wouldn't measure health equity without talking about life expectancy and outcomes, right? We, we just wouldn't do it. We wouldn't talk about math instruction without talking about student outcomes. We wouldn't talk about literacy instruction without talking about student outcomes. So if we need to talk about equity deeply, we have to consider the outcomes our students have in addition to the inputs or ways that we go about trying to provide equity. And so that's why we've chosen to include outcomes as a piece of this. And that's feedback that I've received pretty consistently from the committee over time is don't just tell us what the process is, tell us what the outcome is going to be. 
And so that's something that we're very keenly focused on and why we think this is an important component. But what I don't want to do is mistake the idea that we're working toward equitable outcomes, which is our goal, meaning that we think every student is somehow going to end up the same because that's just not the case. Um, I, do, I will point out the graphic here, I think is a fantastic graphic. Um, so thank you to Don and thank you to Diane for, for forwarding this idea. But it just shows this idea of inequality first is when there's different levels of access to something and there's something that's unequal in terms of the opportunities people have. And so obviously it shows the tree bent over and all the apples are sitting on one side of the tree. Someone has all the apples, someone else doesn't. Um, equality is if we gave both people the same size ladder, but yet we know the tree is bent and all of the apples are sitting on the lower side of the tree and the person with the same size ladder on the other tree, on the other side of the tree still can't get to apples. Equity is when we build custom tools so that people have that opportunity to access what they need. However, justice is when you actually fix the system and say, well, you know what, maybe if we prop up the tree or we think about the tree a little bit differently, everyone can get what they need without having to just have barriers and custom tools to get there. So, and that's that idea. When we keep talking about universal design, that's really the justice piece of this is we need to design this from the ground up so that everything is accessible to all of our students in that general education environment to the greatest degree possible. Social emotional learning is the fourth overarching idea um, and we want to improve students social emotional development through aligned continuum of skills, instruction and supports. We've been doing a lot with social emotional learning over a number of years in this district. A couple of years ago we brought in district management group, actually I think it was last year? So six years ago, last year, <laughs> we brought in the district management group uh, to do a program evaluation. And they recognized that we have a lot of strengths, but they also identified some weaknesses and areas of opportunity for us. All three of these come right out of that program evaluation the district management group did, which is really thinking more about the knowledge and skills that we want students to have in a more cohesive way. When we talk about social emotional learning, we are talking about a discrete set of skills that students can acquire and are learnable. They're not just inherent, they're not innate, these are learnable skills. But the idea that we can help students build more self-awareness, more self-management skills, uh, which certainly has been a focus of this district, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And that all happens within a larger context. And so how can we move our district to think more about uni universally about the types of skills that we want students to acquire? And then, similar to what we want to do on the academic side, how do we make sure that we have an aligned continuum of supports and services that allow all students to access good instruction that allow them to make progress on these skills? So that's really the overarching ideas. Um, contained within the strategy. Um, the strategy is not complete, but we're in a little bit of a chicken and an egg. You heard the um, discussion with the policy around program review that it called for the district to develop key data points and indicators to measure progress on any strategies we implement. Um, we don't want to start developing the key indicators until we know we have agreement among the committee about moving a strategy forward because that's time that's just not going to be spent valuably. We have some initial ideas and we're excited to share those with you. It's not tonight. Our goal tonight is to gain consensus around this strategy. Um, we also know that each of these initiatives here is going to require an action plan that's going to evolve over a period of time. But again, we don't want to start developing action plans for things that we don't have consensus on. Um, and so that's why I say it's a little bit of chicken and egg where we have to first agree on the overarching ideas in the strategy and then be able to move to the details over time as this unfolds. Um, we are hoping that we adopt the strategy by the end of the school year, preferably tonight, but the goal is to have it in place. We have worked through a process with uh, principals to have kind of an aligned school improvement plan across all of our schools in a consistent format. Um, and the idea that we want to preserve kind of the uniqueness of each of our schools, but also understand that, um, you know, the boats all have to be in the same waterway in order to make effective progress. It's one thing to row in the same direction, but if your boats are in different bodies of water, boy, can that be a challenge. Um, and so, you know, what we want to do is have schools align with two of the overarching district strategies, and then they can also choose individual school goals in addition to that. 
So there's this idea of cohesiveness and autonomy at the school level built into this. Um, we are going to extend the timeline normally. Um, I would receive school improvement plans from principals at the end of this year, and then I would have give them to you for a period of comment. I would receive the comments, give them to principals, they would make revisions, and then um, as appropriate with their school councils and then resubmit for my final approval. This year we're actually going to extend it because we're just finishing a strategy now. The principals have had the draft strategy, they've been thinking about it, we've obviously been aligning goals with it for the better part of two years. Um, but uh, we want to give a little bit additional time so that principals can work with school councils this spring, which they've started to do. In our leadership retreat, we'll return to the strategy and look at the school improvement plans together um, collaboratively across schools and look for areas that we can work together um, and have principals have an opportunity to talk about what they're doing in each school improvement plan, um, get some feedback on them, and then take that feedback back to school councils in the fall, and that's when we would start to adopt these. So it is a more delayed timeline than what you would traditionally see, but it's in order to be able to give schools enough time to align with this newer version of the strategy. So that's where we're at tonight, um, and I am happy to take you know questions and comments, um, thoughts about this. So thank you, Peter, for putting together such a cohesive, um, I don't know, a cohesive summary of all that we have done um, on, through this process. Um, I know that there was um, some thought that this was a quick decision and that it was coming to the committee uh, very quickly, but this has actually been a multi-year process. Um, and I think as someone who has sat on this committee now through multiple superintendents, um, it's high time that we had something that was more cohesive that could align our schools and, and everything else. So I think that this work is very exciting. Kira, do you have a question or a comment? I do. Can we go back to the equity slide, please? And I want Which to, one? The, the one with the, with the graphic. Yes, hi. Okay, so can we talk about the justice tree and pull the thread just a little bit further? The critique is that we are disregarding the individual talents of our students, those who are advanced versus those who may not be advanced. Can you please pull the thread all the way through with the justice tree and how there, there is no changing of the individuals in this graphic there is no dishonor of the, the individuals in the graphic. It is simply that we've given the tools that they need to get the apples. Yeah, you know, I think one of the areas I think this plays out is like access to advanced coursework. Um, we have plenty of faculty and staff to provide as many sections of advanced coursework as we want to at our high school. Like that is, we're, we're not at a deficit for that. Um, and so when we talk about increasing access, it's not about, we're not making the tree smaller in any way. Uh, the tree is still the same size. We still have all of those opportunities available for people, but what we're doing is trying to increase access to it. Um, and so I've all long felt that one of the hallmarks of, you know, between a good district and a great district is, you know, for one, for me, is how many students with disabilities are accessing advanced coursework. Um, that is a really important indicator because we know that when we support students and provide the appropriate accommodations, all students can access that high level learning. This is not about lowering the bar, it's about keeping the bar and raising the bar, but raising the bar for all of our students, not, not just some. Evelyn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Peter, for a fantastic overview of this very important work. I just wanted to add that, you know, Justice doesn't mean you're taking away from someone to give to another. I think that's the key point that we need people to understand, that we're not stealing from Peter to give to Paul. It is just making sure that Peter also has what Paul has. That's all. It's just humanity. You know, we are so fortunate here that we have one of the top school districts in the state. And if you look at the last few years, our high school consistently performs among either the first, second, or top 10 of high schools. And I don't know what the difference, to be honest, between number one and number 10 really is um, in any given year. But that really doesn't matter. Look, what really matters to me is we wanna make sure that we have a top school district for every student. 
and that means that we have to think about each student as a unique student and think about how they need to be challenged. In some students, it means they need more challenge. Other students, it means they need more support to access challenge. Um, but we want to continue to raise the bar, but just do it for all of our students. Angie? Yeah, thank you, Peter. This is very helpful. Um, to continue the uh, Kara's question, so for the AP courses, does that mean that all students, they don't need to requirements to, in order to attend the AP anymore, or is there the, the level still maintained the same? And, this, and also the 3.4, a lot of parents apparently have question on that. Can you make sure that you explain that one? Yeah, I, here, here's a good example. Um, and I, I think I'm accurate on this. I was at least of a few years ago. Um, I think US News and World Report just released some, like, what's the top school district in every state, which I really, again, don't buy into, but I think Hopkinton was highlighted. Uh, it was at least on my Apple News feed that I got. Um, Hopkinton, I believe, has every student in their school take AP Biology, and they perform well. So the, when we talk about like how schools are getting evaluated, no longer is it just how do your, a small subset of your top students perform, but how are you helping all of your students perform at that high level? What the research tells us is that prerequisites are not a good indicator of access to advanced coursework. They're just not. Um, you know, there's a lot of bias that goes into prerequisites. There is, you know, grades. You know, we could talk about grades a lot because, you know, grades are not just the f last and best measure of a student's learning. There's a lot that goes into a grade that can influence how they access prerequisites. You have some students who develop some of the intellectual skills and the study habits of mind later in their schooling. Um, and if they're tracked into a lower track, never have an opportunity to then gain access to higher level skills. And so I actually believe that um, you don't necessarily have to, um, we don't wanna create a wall around our advanced placement coursework that's designed to keep students out of it. What we wanna do is think carefully about how we can help students bridge the gap into the advanced placement coursework or, or honors coursework or whatever coursework they want, whether it's um, jazz band, at the high school might be something they want to do, whether it's a sports team they want to perform on. How do we help get more students access to the different types of opportunities that they want to have as they progress through our district? Um, and I think, you know, um, I have personal experience in a school where we removed prerequisites um, and we ended up increasing um, AP enrollment by over 10% a year for three consecutive years. And at the same time, our test scores went up. That's pretty significant data that you actually can expand access and maintain high performance or even improve performance over the same period of time. I think what it challenges is maybe some existing beliefs that we have that the, that, that wall that we've, you know, every institution builds walls. I mean, all institutions have them, but the walls that we've built around some of our advanced coursework may actually, in fact, need to be challenged a little bit in order to really provide each and every student the type of challenge they need to have. Yes, Angie. Thank you. Um, well, I think the, uh, the trouble I have to understand this concept is because we have the MTSS um, system to, to, build, to help each student, yes, so we are enable the student to be able to each the level. So the prerequisite is still there because um, we are helping the student be able to reach the, the prerequisite, just like the sports, like the, you join the chorus. You have to be able to sing, you know, you have to make a voice. So there is certain prerequisite for, for any of these activities in the school. So are we saying we're taking the prerequisite for all, all activities or are we, how we, how are we gonna handle that? I mean, because to me that for the teacher to teach in the class that, you have to be able to know some fundamental skills to, in order to learn, be able to benefit from the class, right? And we have the system, we have the coaching now that we are enable the student to be able to learn, to reach that level so they can enjoy the course level they, they're gonna go to. I'm, I'm all for that we should encourage every student that to go to the, the course level they should be, but I'm not kind of, I, I have trouble handling the, uh, where, 
level down than the, the uh, for all courses. Yeah. Uh, just just so I clarify, I'm not sure that was in our strategy. So I like that that's not our intent at all. Uh, we don't have anything about lowering levels, things like that in our strategy. Our goal is to actually increase opportunities for students, not decrease them. So I just want to make sure we're clear about what the strategy is and not not go in a different direction with it. And Angie, I, something that comes to my mind is when back before COVID, we were allowed to visit the schools and we visited the high school and we visited those of us who were able to attend that, visited an honors math class that was like junior year or senior year math class that had 32 students in it. So when we're talking about equitable outcomes, when we look at the population of the high school, I would say it's 50-50 boys and girls, just about. I think there may even be a few more girls than there are boys. There was five girls in that class. So when we're talking about equitable outcomes and access, I would expect that there would be 50% girls and 50% boys in any given class at any given level. I, I'm sure that you wouldn't sit here and argue that there weren't more like the reason that there was not as many girls in that class is because they weren't as smart or able as the boys that were in that class. I think that what exists are prerequisites and things that had deterred girls from pursuing that coursework. And so that's what this work is about. It's not about lowering it and eliminating boys from the class or any other discriminating factor that you wanted to look at. It's about providing enough access that other, that all of the students who are able to do it have the opportunity to do it. Does that? Yeah, and, and just if I can add, I actually completely agree with most of your comment um, that you made that one of the reasons we want to start building out the MTSS process, the tiered systems of support process at the elementary level, is to really be able to provide students um, universal access to education from the earliest grades on because that's how we build the skills and capacity over time, right? You, you can't, if a student hasn't taken Algebra 1, they are not going into BC Calculus. Like, the, it just doesn't make sense that way. And so I absolutely agree. There have to be, there are always going to be some prerequisites to things. What I think we want to do is make sure that the prerequisites we have enhance how students experience in a course and don't actually just create walls that are unnecessary for students. I'd like to move to approve the district strategy as proposed. Second. We will have discussion still, so don't worry, Angie. I'm not moving it along. Okay. Um, John, did you have a comment? I do. I wanted to come back to the, uh, uh, the health care statement from the WHO and what you picked up here about um, eliminating remediable differences. Um, and if you have pancreatic cancer, it doesn't matter that your name is Alex Trebek. And if you have glioblastoma, it doesn't matter that your name um, is Ted Kennedy. Um, the outcome is foreordained. So um, is it true that there are some differences in our students that are not remediable? Certainly. Uh, you know, I think there are going to be some differences that are always going to lead students to different outcomes. What we can do, though, is figure out how to maximize the potential of every student. And the follow-up question to that is, in the drug approval process in the European Union, there are two steps. One is they say, yeah, we'll approve the use of your drug. And then the second step is, and by the way, you can sell it for this amount of money. So in other words, they you know, don't provide a blanket, oh, yeah, you can do this. There is actually a, a, an economic determination that says it's worth doing this compared to all of the other things that we could do. And, you know, is it the case that as we implement this strategy, we will also make those decisions about the relative value of various interventions that we could provide for students? Yeah, that's certainly something we want to talk about is, you know, I, I think, you know, in an ideal world, we would have an infinite amount of money that we could spend on everything and just have more of everything. In the world that we live in, if we want to maximize value, then we do have to start looking at 
okay, what are the different things we do in our schools and what's the relative value that they have um, in terms of how we provide education to our students. So there's certainly some element of you know, discernment that we have to place on what are the different programs that we provide? How do we maximize their value? Now, you know, that doesn't mean that we're gonna try and eliminate a whole bunch of programs so that we can only do math. Like, that, that's not our goal. Um, but, you know, we do live in a world where we have to think about the economics of, of what we do, and that's, you know, every business in the world has to think about that, whether we're a public business or a private business. Angie. Yeah, I just want to say, Tessa, it's very rare. I actually agree with what you said. <laughs> but the, the question I have is, are we expecting, using your, your example, and that uh, we have 50% of boys and 50% of girls, is that a result that if we look at a class, we don't have 50% of boys and 50% of girls, and then that's a problem. Is that how, you, how how's that gonna work? Can I jump in on that? I love that example. Um, if we, so if we have 53% of our student population is female overall in our senior class and you know, by default 47% or somewhere about there is, is male or identifies as male. And we saw courses that were 85% male and certain percent female. We wouldn't say that we're gonna not allow males into the class anymore. Like that's not the answer to equity. What is the answer to equity is think about, are there barriers that exist for our female students that we could remove that would allow them to have access to that coursework as well? Um, and so I think, you know, so for example, one of the things that, you know, is so important like in sciences is celebrating female scientists from an early, early age because the more kids see themselves represented in a field, the more excited and engaged they are in that field. And so every, so whenever, regardless of whether it's, we're talking about why do we want to have, make sure that um, our females in our schools from early ages see themselves as mathematicians, scientists, why do we want to make sure that all of our students could see themselves as artists? Why do we want to make sure that our black and Latinx students see themselves reflected in all of our subjects at a level? It's really about making sure that we're removing those barriers that might exist for students to be able to access it. And so, but what we're not doing is putting limits on a different population of student and having cutoffs saying, okay, just because we're trying to get more girls involved in that course, we're reducing the number of boys that can participate. That's, that's never the goal. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, it just, I think the language in the document is, I did, there's a couple of parents came to me and honestly each of them read it all differently. So uh, I kind of want to go back to the 3.4 because a lot of cons quest, uh, parents cons uh, have concern on that one. Can you explain that one? I don't have much more explanation other than like the example we just talked about. Um, so that, you know, for example, if, well, I, I, I don't have more of an explanation that I just gave. I, I think that was probably it. Is there a different, like, I, I think I might be missing a nuance to the question. I guess the question is, instead of the advanced coursework and what about other areas? Are we looking at other areas that prohibit that the student that be able to, to participate and be able to do that? And also, we are not, like you said, we're not looking at the result. We're not level down to, to let all students. So I'm okay with that. I just want to, because I, 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 I was, I have a revised the version, which is I would like to see and that we, we have the practice that empower all students with equitable opportunity in various advanced coursework and areas. And we less emphasize on the output, but because by providing the equitable opportunity, you are by default, we, you will have an equitable outcome 
and when it's not quite in line, we can go back to the process and look at what opportunity that we're missing. But by putting the equitable outcome that you gave the people who read it, an impression that we're expecting everybody get the same, get the A. Yeah, and I would, I would just kind of keep coming back to, you know, it, equity does not mean that all students will have the same outcomes. You know, I, I just want to make sure that's right here in black and white. That's not our goal. Um, you know, what it does mean is that all students should have access to programs, curricula, supports, and interventions designed to eliminate the predictable, avoidable, or remediable differences. Right? Like, I, I want to have a narrower definition of that. Um, and so that's why I want to make sure it's right here, shared, and, and, and out there. Because, I, yeah, we definitely want to dispel this idea that all students will come out the same from our schools. It's just not possible. And so, Angie, I am going to move the discussion along because we have been talking about this literally for years, and our workshop did focus on the ability for school committee members to make changes that they felt or give input that they felt was important um, to this document, which is why we had it two weeks ago so that Peter could in, in, so that he could include that input in what he brought us tonight. Kira, did you have something else to say? I do. I, I wonder, um, and I know this is going to make everybody sigh deeply and be upset, but I do wonder if it might be wise to postpone this vote to the next meeting, providing just a little bit of this clarity to the community, give them this slide, give them that beautiful example of the 50-50 gender class. Can we give just a, a small case study uh, for clarification that lives with these slides in an email so that we've, we've done all of that communication that everybody said that we didn't do. And then when, when we come back, we can say, this was the package, here were all the years, and here is the clarity for your burning questions, and then it's five minutes and booyah, we have the vote. And I, I know everybody's like, no, please don't do that. But I'm, I, I'm putting that on the table only because that was what was asked, and I just wonder if that will ease a touch of this. You know, my personal take is I'm certainly open to that. What I would suggest I, we can't probably do is if we want to make changes, we probably don't have time th through the end of this year. We just have too many other things on our plate where if we're making major changes, that would definitely be next year. I'm not yeah. proposing changes. Yeah. I am proposing communication and clarity. Um, cause, uh, and I will just say, even with, your, with the slide, with, the, um, with your cognitive, can you go back to the one with, the, with cognitive mm -hmm. and emotional? Etc. I would love to see this in layman's terms. I, th I think that sometimes we take for granted the language that we use here with the expertise that we have in the room, and then it trickles out into the wider community, and some people are able to access it, and then others are not. And I think, I, I wonder if this is an access problem, and that we might be able to ease four big things by, by just, by, by providing just a touch more. Amy? I, I like what you're, I do like what you're saying, Kira. Um, I'm, I think that, I think that the, the people in the room understand, oops, understand what is on the document. So I would push for voting tonight but I would definitely ask that some follow-up to the community, exactly what you're suggesting, goes out. I, don't, I just don't think it needs to um, hinder us taking a vote on it tonight, because I don't think there's a, there's a lack of clarity among us. I was going to concur with that, Amy. I was going to say that if we're not looking for additional input, which we are not, because we are not looking for additional proposed changes, that maybe the vote could go forward and maybe in Peter's superintendent update that goes out to the community, we can include some of the, the graphics and things to just explain what that meant. Uh, Ginny? Um, so I, I would um, agree with Kira, I think. It's important, I think, that you know, having read the emails over the last couple of days that we received, it reflects um, that a lot of people do not understand um, what you've presented here today. And I think it's important for us as representatives of our community to not 
vote on something that our community, you know, that, that maybe a large segment of our community doesn't understand um, before, you know, we now have that feedback from the emails we got that week and, you know, some of the questions tonight to say, okay, this is the part that did not get through to, you know, we don't know how many people. And I, I second Kira's, you know, with this, this slide, you know, in, in probably, you know, less, you know, uh, complex language illustrates conclusively that we are not saying that we're not going to have high standards. This is comprehending, understanding difficult concepts, acquiring difficult skills. That's, that is still part of what we're saying. So engagement incorporates you know, keeping our standards high. And again, I think the emails we received and some of the feedback we received demonstrates that people are not understanding that we're not saying that everybody gets to the end of the race at the same place. As one emailer said, that means that, you know, everybody, all the runners have to run as slow as the slowest runner. So that's not what they're saying. So I, ju I just felt like, while I appreciate, um, that we're not, you know, we're not um, asking for, for changes, that doesn't mean that we can't have feedback that informs, you know, where there's a disconnect and then address that so that, you know, our community doesn't think that we're going forward with something um, that hasn't been communicated clearly enough to them. So I think that tonight's presentation really demonstrates that this is a years long process. This didn't come up from two meetings ago. We're not rushing a vote. Um, you know, the, these are the misunderstandings. We need to communicate that part more clearly. Um, and, and then once we do that, I think it would serve our, ourselves and our, as a committee and our community better by, by waiting. Evelyn and then Diane. So I um, just want to echo some of what um, Jean, Jean. Jeannie said, I think the disconnect is that folks think that if we remove the requirements to get into advanced classes, all of a sudden, the quality of those classes are going to be low, they're going to run slow, and then all of a sudden, the smart kids are not going uh, to enjoy their class. That's not what we're saying. So I think we need to communicate that to the community to understand that by removing access and allowing whether more girls or whoever in a class doesn't mean that the curriculum is going to change, that the teachers are going to teach at a substandard level, that all of a sudden the class is not going to be as enriching as it was the previous year. I think that's where the disconnect is, and that's what we need to communicate to people. I don't know how we're going to get that across, but we need to let people know that it's going to be the same. Adam? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Diane. Okay. So um, just, I just wanted to say two things. One is a reaction to um, Angie's comment that equitable access means equitable outcomes. And I'm just going to say that, you know, 70 years of the development of the laws for students with, uh, around students with disabilities does not support that, that you can get access. It does not mean that you're automatically going to get the outcomes. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and then the second thing is I just wanted to respond to this conversation here. I would like to take a vote tonight. And the reason why is because we got really great feedback from the community. There is misunderstanding. We have no, I don't want to dupe the public and kind of delay the vote as if like putting it out there is going to invite modifications and adjustments and revisions to this district strategy because it isn't. And I think that's going to create a lot of ill will among the public. We can go out there and talk about what we talked about tonight. We can translate that slide and do a lot of like engagement out there to help people understand what we mean, but it doesn't mean that we can't vote tonight because if we're not asking for the public's input in order to make change, I think we're, we're stepping into kind of dangerous waters with the public. So for that reason, I support voting tonight. 
Uh, Diane, you said a lot of what I was going to say. I think I have, I have two comments, and I've, I've been particularly quiet tonight because I'm, I'm somewhat emotional about this. Um, I, I, I think we learned in our seed training early this year that you know, when, when someone says something that uh, makes you feel uncomfortable, you say, ouch, and you let them know. And I've been a bit reserved about that, but I think you know, there were a number of comments that we got um, from the public that, that clearly uh, communicated the fact that they did not understand um, sort of what was being presented. But what they implied was that a student from a different socioeconomic background or a student with a disability is not trying hard. And that's why they're not in these higher level courses. And that really hurts because I may have a student with an economic disability or I may have a student with a disability. And to say that my student can't achieve that AP coursework because you think they're not working hard, that really hurts to hear. So I, I mean, I think this is important for us to come out and say as an elected body, we support this, uh, we support this strategy. And at the same time, acknowledge the fact that there are clearly members of our community who um, have not gotten to the same point or have not had the opportunity to access this information in the same way. But to Diane's point, that's not gonna change what happens. And more importantly, as Peter communicated towards the end of the presentation, there are a lot of follow-on steps that need to happen after we approve this, this strategy, which is to go and engage with our school-level administration to go put in place school improvement plans that, um, that speak to this policy, uh, to this strategy. So, you know, I think that, I, I, obviously I made the motion, I'm in favor of, of approving the strategy, and I'd really like to see that done tonight and then go out to the community and say, here's why we as the elected body who have been in the room, who have been talking about this for years, why we approved it and why we think it's important. Um, I think I'm also in favor of voting tonight. I think the, uh, the other thing is that, you know, strategy is only a starting point. Strategy then turns into plans and then we execute things. Um, and I think, you know, as I looked at the, the slide with the apple tree, part of the discussion revolved around what would that look like in a real example in our school system. So one of the things that I took away from this is that what we, you know, as a school district need to deliver back to the public are those working examples that says this is what it actually meant. Um, and it speaks to two things. One is that we've continued to drive to high performance, that students really are being driven to their potential, and we've done that in an equitable way. And if we can show that, through examples as we implement that, then I think you know, these concerns about what is the strategy really doing will be addressed. And if we can't do that, we got other problems. Yeah, Ben? Uh, thank you, Peter, for the great uh, explanation. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, so first, last year I, I was here attending the social emotional the, the presentation, so I was totally lost. So today, but well, also last time, the workshop, the social emotional, a lot of things, I kind of get there. So t tonight it's better. So obviously there's some some mis misunderstanding. It takes me for quite a while to kind of a get it, uh, still not fully get into. So that's one, just comments, although it has been developed for years. So second one is, uh, so the, for, uh, you had a slide say equity is uh, basically is to try to, let me quote, ensure all students have equitable access to programs and the curriculums to reach their potentials. So here we say we are gonna open say, uh, remove the barrier of prerequisite for all the students uh, to the advanced class. So have you thinking about also say, this is a kind of a, we are, we are gonna promote a lot of students to get into the same. So what about the other group of people maybe have a further potentials to grow? So that's one, how, I, how are we gonna make that happen? So that's question one. So another one is also follow up with the John's question, right? Assuming we assuming we have infinite amount of budget that we can do whatever we want. Uh, but the reality is we have limited resources. Uh, so it's kind of a zero sum game, but it's, it's ugly, right? Zero sum game probably is not true, but it's a kind of, a, uh, how are you gonna address that kind of a challenge? So, so 
plus one in the in the in the in the four figures. So there's a justice. I also Googled it and found a similar plot. So the key actually is to find the root cost right, of the find the root cost to eliminate the predictable uh, avoidable whatever differences. So do we have the clear idea of the root causes? That's a great question. And so we've had a, a team um, with Debbie Dixon, um, who is our interim special education director, has been doing a lot of work this year attending some seminars around disproportionality at the state level, which is when you have, uh, you know, basically predictable outcomes that are out of skew. Um, and one area of disproportionality for us has been in over identification of students of color with communication disabilities. Um, and so that's been something they've done some work at with the state around identifying a root cause analysis of that. That was, and I think we talked about this a, a couple of meetings ago when we presented on the idea of why we wanted a multi-tier system of supports. The root cause is we don't have really clear alignment within the support structures of the school and we have to also continue to grow how we're providing access in kind of our general education environment. So um, we need to really do some work as a district around looking at student data more deeply, understanding why students may not be performing, expanding the type and quality of data that we look at to make sure that we're really catching students um, and that we're able to provide supports in a timely fashion and understand whether interventions are working quickly um, and not waiting long periods of time for a student to fail before we identify them. Um, or we can provide it in an environment that doesn't need to just be special education. So part of that root cause analysis of why we are having predictable outcomes for students at an unacceptable level led us to actually propose the MTSS proposal that came before you a couple of meetings ago. So really, again, and it's, again, it, it's not about how do we lower the bar? It's how do we increase supports for students um, so that they can they can raise the bar. Okay, I'm going to say that it is nine o'clock, and we are 40 minutes behind schedule, and I feel that I am proud of Adam for saying what he said because as I read those emails I also experienced a lot of ouch and I really hope that as we communicate to our community after this meeting um, that we can sort of start to dispel this myth of effort as related to achievement um, because Anyone who has a student with a disability or who has worked with students with disabilities or other students maybe who, who come from a lower socio, from a different socioeconomic background who may not have had as much access to, to many, many things um, knows these students often try harder than any students in our entire district. And so this myth that achievement is really tied to effort is something that I think we have to work very hard to dispel. So I am going to, um, I, I think we should vote tonight. I think that our committee has had plenty of time to talk about this and to look at this and I understand that everybody has not had the same amount of time on the committee to consider this, but I do think that in order for our district to move forward that it's incredibly important for us to take this vote and um, to allow the administration time to move, um, to move forward with the next steps of taking a strategy and putting it into place with actual um, actions and outcomes, okay? So we have, a, um, we have a motion and a second, so we will go around and vote. Adam? Oh, we don't have to. All those in favor, sorry. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Can I have a clarification? So, Peter, will you include any, <clears throat> what Kara suggests, um, to clarify a, a, um, attached to this document? You know, in all honesty, we've received some feedback um, 
from some members of our, in, in particular our Chinese community, who have found our translations to be poor of written documents, that the YouTube stream of school committee meetings is actually quite accurate, or much more accurate than even some of our written translations we've been providing. So my thought is to actually be able to send out the YouTube link to this discussion, along with slides from the presentation um, and some communication to families about what we're trying to do with this. Um, I can't guarantee it's tomorrow morning, but we can certainly work on that over the next few days to a week and kind of provide a lot of this, this discussion here tonight, the context of it, uh, back out to families. I, I think that was on our intention anyway, is once we kind of get this together, to then really think about how we're educating the community around what we're trying to do. All right, are there any nays? No, just one nay, any abstentions? Okay, so did you get that, Beth? All right, thank you, everybody. All right, Peter, multi-tiered system of support. <laughs> Standing break. Um, so, you know, this is not a presentation tonight. We gave a pretty long presentation um, a couple of weeks ago about the rationale for a multi-tier system of support. But I think, you know, one thing that we found through listening to some of the feedback was there were two key areas where we heard a lot of feedback around concerns about moving forward with MTSS. Um, one area was around linking funding to classroom assistance and a strong need from teacher, feeling from teachers and some of our community members that they wanted to maintain classroom assistance as we progress through you know, next year and as we look into the future. I think another area was thinking through making sure that we provide enough direct support to students as we make this transition into a new kind of support structure as a district and having kind of that hands-on experience with kids. Those were the two big areas of feedback. And so we listened to that as a leadership team. We've had quite a few discussions about it. Um, we brought a secondary proposal to our budget subcommittee um, this past Monday um, and had kind of a lengthy funding discussion. And what we would like to propose to do, is, actually, before I get into the proposal, I will also say that I have one elementary school I haven't been able to schedule a meeting with yet, but I've met with all the other elementary schools, uh, kind of an optional faculty meeting, to talk about the MTSS proposal. In general, what I'm hearing, there are some that express concern, this sounds like more work. Um, and for some people, it might be more work because it's new and, and there's a learning curve to that. Um, but it's going to gradually unfold over time. But the general sentiment was, look, we buy into this idea of thinking differently about how we support students and we're seeing that students' needs are different and we want to work on that. We just don't want it tied to assistant funding and we, we think we want more direct support at first. There were some schools that actually preferred coaching um, and had very strong sentiments that they preferred coaching over um, other alternatives. So it's not universal that there's, there's one preference. But what we did do as a leadership team is decide to unlink the idea of moving forward with MTSS to classroom assistant funding. And instead, what we'd like to propose is funding this through the use of our next ESSER grant, which is slated to be just under a million dollars. Um, and, you know, that has implications for the long-term budget of the district. And so we shared with the budget subcommittee uh, on Monday kind of a three to four year plan for how that could be incorporated into the budget gradually through a declining um, allocation from ESSER money. And we didn't want to do it independent of other school committee initiatives, so we incorporated uh, all day K into that analysis as well. And what we found is that it's basically about a third of a percent or 0 .003 um, increase to the budget in a given year. And that's average because some years it's a little bit more, some years it's a little bit less, but it's about a third of a percent increase to the budget to be able to fully fund this MTSS proposal and gradually reduce kindergarten tuitions so that that, you know, all day K becomes free um, over time. Along the same timeline that we had initially proposed, this is included in your packet, but it's in the financial section, um, you know, but you may have been able to take a look at it. That was the intent was to provide this to you. Um, we did provide a couple of different alternatives to uh, the budget subcommittee. 
we provided another alternative that had one fewer literacy coach, and we only proposed one literacy coach funded through the student opportunity grant that we got from DESE. Um, but there was an educational impact to that, but we did discuss the, the relative merits of funding it in a more aggressive way through the use of ESSER funding or reducing, you know, uh, taking a more cautious approach from a funding mechanism. But I think as we talked it through with budget sub, there was more support to make sure we provided the additional literacy coach rather than trying to wait on that as well. So what we're proposing to do is provide six full-time math specialists, one for each elementary school as a full-time position. We currently have six half-time assistant positions um, in mathematics at each school. Um, and as you might recall, those assistants don't necessarily report directly to a specialist, so they're a little bit more on their own. Five of those six assistants were not going planning to come back to the district next year. So those are vacancies right now. So there's, and the one remaining assistant actually is a licensed professional as well, uh, but happens to be in that halftime role now. So there's a chance to do this without necessarily having to reduce staff at this point. It's just filling vacancies with a different type of position and a licensed position. So we would like to move forward with six math specialists, and then we have a $100,000 grant that we've um, been committed to from DESE. We'd like to use that for one literacy coach, um, and then we'd like to add a second literacy coach because that idea of having two coaches added at the same time provides coverage for four schools, and then the other two schools can be covered by our current curriculum coordinators from a coaching mechanism, and that would provide what we think is an adequate level of support for the early literacy initiative that we have going. It also mirrors the process that we used to add our STEAM coaches, where you added two in one year, and then over time we got to the third STEAM coach. So, you know, it does have um, funding implications. We've listed those out here. It does mean that over the next several years, we will have to find about a third of a percent within the school budget to be able to allocate to this. Um, and, you know, we've been pretty successful over the last few years in finding money for different initiatives. Um, but we think this is a valuable one to be able to do, and so we wanted to bring that forward for consideration. This is certainly right within school committee's purview because it's going to have budget implications in future years. Um, and we, we don't want to shy away from that discussion, but we think we have merit and we have some steam to be able to move this work forward, and it's going to provide a higher level of support for our kids returning from the pandemic, which is why we want to move forward with it at this time. So. I'm happy to answer questions. There's a memo in your packet uh, with kind of the high level overview of it. We're not getting into the whole of MTSS tonight. That's not the intent. Um, you know, we have told our faculty that, you know, if we move forward with this, what we intend to launch next year is a really in-depth planning process that engages school-based leadership teams around MPSS and a district leadership team that's comprised of stakeholders from all of our different groups to provide feedback into that. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, we would love the school committee support on that, but I'm happy to answer questions and and hear feedback. Yeah, Ben. So it's a, it, it reminded me the how hard the budget uh, discussion was in the in the past two months ago, right? So we find here and there to cut to find a say to save $100,000 probably. So now it's gonna, we're gonna increase how much? So right now it's, uh, we're, we're gonna use uh, federal's money, diocese money, so after three years, how? So that's 0.3% uh, of the budget increase, right? So yeah, I just wanna, because it's so hard this year's <laughs> budget discussion. I just. Yeah, that's, uh... yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I think that's why when we first brought this to the committee, we were looking to try and do this in a budget neutral way. Uh, but in the absence of that, we believe in the value of the program high enough that we want to bring it forward for more discussion, even though now it has budgetary impact. Um, I think one thing we've talked about uh, with budget sub and with district leadership is, you know, we want to do a complete analysis of how we spend money as a district and be able to look for a variety of opportunities that we can save money in one way in order to reallocate it in different ways. Um, so we intend to actually hire a company to come in and help us with that analysis next year uh, prior to the budget process so that they can help us identify opportunities. 
John? I'm in favor of this proposal. One of the other questions, obviously, in a big budget picture is, you know, what other kind of things could show up in our budget? Um, and obviously, you know, a key driver of our budget is the student population. And so that was part of the budget sub uh, discussion. Um, and we believe from a demographics perspective that over these next few years, we'll still be in a relatively benign environment. So although maybe the elementary schools will start to rise a little bit, those low elementary school populations are now moving into the middle school and uh, and then ultimately into the high school. So we don't expect to see a lot of staffing pressure you know, in, at the secondary levels with the overall consequence being that the biggest factor that could present budgetary challenges is not likely to appear in the near term. So, you know, on the one hand, yes, you know, we still remain, you know, pushing hard to, you know, get to the budget that we have. But on the other hand, you know, I, I think this level of risk is low compared to the, the benefit of the program. And I, just to expand on John's comment, one of the things we looked at, um, you know, in terms of funding this, we're actually able to incorporate um, just this year alone about $194,000, uh, excuse me, and Dave, I might pull you up because I want to make sure I'm looking at the right column here. Um, in terms of, here. Dave, I think you're there, but we have flexibility even within the current, the next year operating budget because we have attrition at the high school and we do not need to necessarily fill sections because the enrollment is low enough. Um, and so as we will be in a declining enrollment pattern for a few years still, um, we're gonna see opportunities arise within the district to shift resources. And that, that's, I think, the discussion. I, is that correct, John? Yes. All right. And Dave, do you have anything that you would add on that? Evening, everybody. Uh, no, um, you, I think, didn't say the number. The number that's in the spreadsheet is 129,000. 129, thank um, you. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Where it says yep. budget redux. Yeah. I'd like to move to approve the superintendent's request to add the positions as detailed with the understanding that there is no increase to the FY22 budget. Second. Is there any other discussion? Diane? Just um, that I appreciate um, the urgency of including both the literacy and math specialists, coaches, et cetera, and the reduction in tuition for all day K and not having to choose between those because they're both they both have a real sense of urgency about it. Um, and so just let me, uh, just for clarity purposes, after the ESER money runs out, we're hoping that there's, a, you know, uh, uh, there are other factors that are gonna come into play to kind of cover those costs, those ongoing costs of paying for new staff. Do you wanna to talk to that too? Or Dave? Dave? Dave's raising his hand, so I'll let him jump in. First. Yeah. Hi, Diane. So if you, if you can follow and, and I, I'm not going to walk through the the five year progression on the on the spreadsheet, but the point of it is that by the end of the fifth year, the additional costs are melded into the regular budget base, and so there's no increment remaining to fund these positions. It could be that uh, there are other positions related to either an offshoot of this initiative or an entirely different initiative that would need to be funded. But this proposal is fully funded after year five. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I think this is going to make a big difference for our students in the district. And I think it's being done in a way that I think our teachers will feel supported through the process, hopefully. All right, so apparently we have to evaluate Peter this year. <laughs> so um, I gave you a little bit of a high level uh, overview last time. I think Peter is gonna give us a final report on his FY21 goals. I think that what we all need to keep in mind is that this year has been an extraordinary year in many, many ways and um, our evaluation is not gonna look maybe the same as it would have in the past. There was specific guidance from MASC last year as 
to how we should evaluate different goals. And I do think that um, even given the pandemic, many of the things that Peter um, took on as his goals this year are things that we have continued to work on throughout the year, albeit maybe a little bit more slowly. But um, Peter's going to give us his final report. Um, and then members of the public are, are encouraged or asked if they have input to give um, to send that into the committee. and. Um, we'll do a summative evaluation at the meeting on June 17th after I've received all of your input. Um, so Peter, go right ahead. So I, I included a memo with um, kind of a goals update. I'm not doing a presentation on this tonight. I'm just going to talk you through what to expect as you read this. Um, you know, I will say and a little bit of preface, I remember pulling my goals back up and we've worked on them as we've gone. But I pulled it up and I started to look at all of it, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago and all I could do was laugh. Um, and I thought, wow, this was only a few months ago. What were we thinking? Um, and so there's areas of this that we were over ambitious and we just didn't meet them. There's other areas where actually I think we've done a pretty good job meeting goals. Um, you know, what I will say is overall, I just want to make sure I thank all of our staff. The, the thing that stands out to me overarching the year, with, even with the goals, is the pandemic impacted every single aspect of our school and district operations. We saw our cafeteria staff um, really rise up and provide over 200,000 meals in the community. That had never been done before. We, our operations staff worked 24-7 prior to the start of the school year and has been, you know, really just, you know, going straight through all year, making sure things were cleaned and sanitized and ready to roll for students. Um, our transportation office, I don't know how many times they've had to reroute kids um, this year and plan new routes and think about, you know, bus capacities and, you know, make sure they're taking accurate attendance on every bus every day, something they've never had to do before so that we can contact trace. I mean, this is really widespread and that doesn't even get into the teaching and learning that happens within the schools and how many times our teachers and staff have had to modify teaching plans. Uh, you know, we had to, I remember in December, you know, this is, it feels like ages ago, but we had to shift our, you know, kind of hybrid learning plan um, and include more kind of Zoom time, so to speak, in order to meet new state requirements that came out in November. So, you know, all of our teachers had to pivot and shift there. Um, principals have certainly had to do a ton of work. Um, all of our district level leaders, the same thing, just an inordinate amount of work. And our nurses have been going 24 seven. They're answering calls on nights, on weekends, doing contact tracing at all hours of the night. So I just can't express enough gratitude to them and just, you know, kind of provide the backdrop that that really was the focus of this year. It has not been perfect. Um, there is nothing that's been perfect this year, and I don't want to portray that, but I do want to portray the gratitude for the effort. Overarching, we opened our schools and will have been open 170 days this year, which is every day of the year. We've opened our doors for kids. Um, we've done it successfully. We have not had outbreaks in our schools. Things have been contained. People have taken protocols seriously. That's a testament to our families. It's a testament to our students. It's a testament to all of our educators and staff as well. So with that said, when you look at this, we were not going to link 4,000 pieces of evidence. We would have spent two weeks just trying to compile evidence. The overarching strategy we used in developing this document was that for each goal, we gave you some selected evidence of highlights for that we thought there was a document that might be impactful for you to see. But then for each of the action steps, we provided a really brief summary of what we did to date on that goal. Um, sometimes the evidence is directly linked to it. Sometimes it's not. And, you know, we're in all honesty trusting that, you know, we're not going to come in and <laughs> make things up about what we've done, especially when we said, yeah, we didn't do this. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think what we tried to do is provide enough of an overview so you got a sense of how far we got on our goals. Um, you know, as the professional practice goal, which is supporting leadership transitions, there was no great evidence of that that we found that we could really link. So instead, that's more of a narrative description of what we did. Um, you know, we have significant leadership transition and that was important to us. And I wanted you to know how we're thinking about it and what we're doing. But 
you know, I'm working currently with incoming administrators to develop kind of transition plans and entry plans, but I'm not going to publish the draft entry plans um, before they finalize them and publish them. So it kind of makes some of this a little bit awkward in translation. Um, but, you know, certainly if you have questions about something, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, but hopefully this is enough of a picture of what we have been doing over the course of the year that you get the flavor for it. So, um, as I said, this is a shorter presentation than what we've done in previous years. Um, but that just is the kind of year it's been. So happy to answer any preliminary questions, but everything is really right here in the memo. I will give this to you in a digital version as well, and we'll post this online. And that way the hyperlinks will work and take you right to the selected evidence. And just so members who have never done this before are aware, you are more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, and I will, uh, Amy, to um, anybody that has been on the committee for a while, I'm sure can, can help um, you figure out this sort of document, which really it's about, about looking at the specifics of what Peter has laid out that has been accomplished by the district. It's not supposed to be like, well, I think Peter did a great job. It's like an evidence-based document, and that's why Peter took the time to lay out the evidence for you so that you can use that in, um, in your actual evaluation. And so what's nice about it is that it is laid out very clearly for us what we're supposed to check off or rate and what those ratings mean and things like that. Um, but like I said, anybody who's been on the committee, I'm sure is happy to answer those questions and you will not be bothering me if you reach out to understand more about what, um, what your specific thing is supposed to be. So what will happen after this meeting, I think there's a timeline in your packet. Um, June 4th is the due date for members to submit their completed written evaluations to me and to Beth. Um, and what I will then do is I will take pieces of those and I will write a summative evaluation that will then be presented publicly at our meeting on June 17th. Um, so it won't, it won't say, well, Kira said that, you know, Peter did this or whatever. I, I mean, I'll take pieces of all of your narratives and the different ratings and things like that and I will, it is the absolute most fun thing that I get to do. <laughs> at the end of my chairmanship um, is to write that summative evaluation. So, Diane? I just have a question. I mean, it's just, I'm just looking. I haven't even, like, you know, thought about the goals um, for, like, ever. And, I mean, if all we did was evaluate Peter on, like, how he handled the pandemic, that would be, like, that would be enough. So, like, I feel like the elephant in the room is the pandemic. And so how, how does that, how, does, how do we work that in? So there wasn't specific guidance from MASC this year in terms of, of how to specifically handle that. So, I mean, certainly that's a discussion that Peter and I have had pretty much every week um, when, we, when we talk about these things. So, you know, I, I think that when we, when we look at the goals, it, it does have to be looked through, looked through with the lens of, of whatever. And I think that you don't need to, I mean, my personal opinion is that you don't need to stick to the ratings of like partially proficient if, you know, we felt like, if you felt like, if a goal wasn't necessarily accomplished. I think that you could override that um, notion and say, but it wasn't because, you know, all of these other steps were, were taken. I mean, obviously, COVID wasn't a goal of Peter's. And so in order to look at all the, you know, to pull out all the evidence of ways in which, you know, he succeeded at, at, at helping our district not only make it through the pandemic, but succeed throughout the pandemic. I mean, I think that that can't be underplayed. That's a good point. John? Because I, I love to color outside the lines and because my other goal is to make Tessa's job as easy as possible. It is true that we should follow the rubric to do part of this, but I actually believe that providing Peter feedback, you know, about in individual reactions to things that have gone well or, or gone poorly um, is a really important part of the evaluation. Um, you know, I wanted to, to highlight two things that I think I've mentioned at least one of them before. Um, which, from my view, were very important, and clearly not, you know, part of Peter's uh, remit. One was something we're going to talk about again: uh, the Edco situation, where um, somebody needed 
you know, to stand up and play a leadership role. And from my view, that's what Peter did. Um, and then people, of course, followed right along behind him. And um, that isn't so directly related to us, but it is so emblematic of, you know, the kind of contributions that he makes. And then the other thing that, you know, has existed in sort of a weird twilight world is we actually set up a whole other school this year, you know, the remote learning program, um, which if, you know, you thought at the end of the beginning of the year, oh, we're going to set up another school, there would have been goals around that and process around it, and we just did it. So um, I think that, you know, as people reflect on different things, you know, bringing those into the evaluation and providing that, that feedback to Peter is helpful. And I guess maybe the last thing in that area is this whole question of communication. So I think everybody who's sat at this table knows communication is actually really hard. You know, sometimes we're successful. We say things, people really get it. It's like, I understand what you're saying. And other times people look at you like, what the heck are you thinking? Um, and maybe Peter's had some of that, and I think that's the other form of, of valuable feedback that everybody can get is like what really did resonate, what worked communication-wise, and what, where can we make some improvements? Thanks, John. And I would also note that um, we need to think about the purpose of an evaluation. So just as our administrators evaluate our teachers and our teachers evaluate our students, the purpose of the evaluation is to give accolades for things that were done well and give constructive criticism or suggestions for things that can be improved. And so this is supposed to be, you know, something that can help Peter moving forward in, in his leadership of our district. So um, if you have questions after that, I think Beth will, like, like Peter said, we'll make sure that it's in a digital format, it'll get sent to everybody and you have a couple weeks. And so the sooner you get it in, the easier it is for me because I'm the one that has to read them all and, um, write the final report. So, um, you know, and the more detail you give, the easier that is for me too, because then I'm not creating the entire narrative myself. So I appreciate all of that. Um, so if there are no other questions, then we can move on to the budget update. Um, and actually, sorry, I'll just say, um, the invitation for the public to provide input on the superintendent's evaluation, if you have that, you can send it directly to me at T. McKinley at AB Schools and copy Beth Petter, B. Petter at AB Schools by June 4th. That would be helpful. All right. Dave? Thanks, Tessa. Um, so this is the third quarter uh, financial report. Material that you have was reviewed in detail with the budget subcommittee. So I'm not going to uh, go through it in as much, de it, it was reviewed in more detail with them, so I'm not going to be as uh, thorough here. Um, overview is self-explanatory. It's the projection of where we will be at the end of the year. And I have numbers comparable um, in, our second, in our second quarter report. I'm trying to see if that's relevant to me, but not yet. Um, so we're better in Q3. Uh, the second quarter numbers had a typical amount of conservatism built in. The ESSER two money was spoken for since our last since our last report that had an impact. And so the current period, um, if we if that projects out to be the final answer at the at the end of the year, would be a slight reduction in E and D between years because we've committed to using a million two uh, in setting the FY22 budget. Um, so I'm gonna fly through here. Tessa, please interrupt if there are any questions, but uh, I'm assuming that you just want a very brief overview of this, of this material. So the, the, next, uh, the next page is specifics related to revenue. There's, there's one big thing that happened, uh, the first, of two state aid payments for transportation reimbursement came in very late. That was the bad news. It came in at the end of March and as opposed to the end of December. The good news is they're reimbursing at us at a rate sub substantially higher than expected. And so as a result, we raised our projection of, of transportation reimbursement aid by over $200,000. It's going to be offset 
uh, and we'll return to this momentarily, it's going to be offset by a transfer of $200,000 to the Transportation Stabilization Fund uh, to assist in, in funding the FY22 budget. So that's the primary difference between Q3, Q3 and Q2 with, with respect to revenue. The next, uh, it's about eight pages long, and it shows the expenditures by administrative category and the line items, summaries of line items within each category and some comparative data and projections by category. Significant changes from the second quarter report and the numbers are, are a lot better here, as I mentioned before, using ESSER II to f specifically to fund the assistance in the RLP program. Those were previously charged to the CVRF grant program, but only were allowed to be charged through, for service through December 30th. Charging the, through the ESSER II program allows us to um, charge the remaining costs for, for the year for the RLP assistance. We cut off departmental spending once the return to school was affected and that resulted in some savings as well. And then at the very bottom of this analysis, so page eight, um, the contingency which has been sitting untouched for most of the year at $500,000 if you remember, we received word of a coronavirus prevention grant, and that was announced by the commissioner several months ago. And it was a it was a formula allocation: twenty five dollars a student plus seventy five dollars per low income student, or about one hundred and sixty hundred sixty five thousand dollars. That was going to be um, found money. Because because the it could be used to uh, to take care of costs that were already included in the budget, but we got an additional assessment from Edco, and I know that um, I know that that's the subject of uh, a discussion that Peter's going to have in a few minutes. So we'll get back to that as well. So I'm next going to go on to the plans for the transfer into transportation stabilization. So if there are any questions on Q3, Tessa, I don't hear any. I don't see any, we're good. Okay. Go so the, the recommended transfer, you have a memo from me dated today and a related DESE advisory about transportation reimbursement revolving funds in AB we refer to it as the transportation stabilization fund. As I just mentioned we got an unanticipated increase in transportation aid during the year and so it's from that source coincidentally that's that's what's in the guidance that's what we're obligated to do. Um, it's actually not hurting us from the numbers we had anticipated. So what we'd like to do is to consider your vote to transfer to the sum of $200,000 from that, from that source of funding. So it's an FY21 revenue source from the state, transfer it into this special fund and it will sit there and be used for funding transportation costs in the FY22 budget. John? And so if you have any questions or uh, wish to consider voting, I've given you some wording at the bottom of that memo. I move that the school committee votes to transfer from the FY 2021 state transportation reimbursement the sum of $200,000 to the district's transportation stabilization fund. Second. Okay. Any questions? Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, that passes unanimously. Dave, I think that's the fastest report you've ever given. Congratulations. Well, well, I didn't think I was done, but. Oh. <laughs> well, apparently we did. <laughs> okay, so I, 
Actually, I see EDCO update is next and FY22 update is after that. So yes. we can do, we can tackle EDCO that is next in line. That's and perfect. then you'll have me back and I'll have the opportunity to give another short report. Perfect. All right, so um, brief update on the EDCO collaborative. As you know, we had voted to terminate uh, the EDCO collaborative earlier this year. Termination proceedings have been progressing. All 16 districts did vote unanimously to terminate the collaborative. Um, it's a very sad day in terms of EDCO history, obviously, and it's a really challenging environment for those working in EDCO uh, right now as all of the operations are ceasing. The EDCO Collaborative will cease operations as of June 30th this year. We have the lease um, of the current EDCO facility that we are ending on July 30th or the end of July. Um, and then EDCO will no longer have a physical location, but we have to continue to exist as an entity through the end of FY22 from a legal standpoint and per DESE regulation while we go through a final audit, make sure all debts are paid off and everything else. Um, there are no program costs for EDCO, but we will have some administrative costs and the, those are detailed in the memo. Uh, it's about $400,000 and that is what the districts will be assessed for next year's operating expenses. Our payment to EDCO will be higher than normal. Normally we're paying about $16,000 a year. It'll be about 30 next year because there's no tuition money coming in from students uh, because there's no more students in EDCO. On a positive note, the staff of EDCO have done a wonderful job of finding homes for nearly every program that EDCO housed. Uh, the most notable was the deaf and hard of hearing program. That's being adopted by another collaborative and it's staying in the Newton Public Schools. So I think that's a really happy ending. The two programs um, that could not find homes, one is a DESE grant, so we don't have control over it as EDCO. Uh, DESE has to control that. And then the other one is an adult um, habilitation program in Rentham, um, which, you know, I think certainly has caused us questions of why a, a student collaborative or a district collaborative is running, running an adult program, um, you know, and, and kind of begs a lot of the questions around why EDCO is not successful right now too. Um, but those are the only two programs that as of right now don't have homes. The rest of the students are going to have homes next year, which is good news. Um, and they're trying to have staff go with students to the extent possible as well. Um, most of the districts in EDCO had greater financial flexibility this current fiscal year than they have in the future. So the board of directors did vote to accelerate some of the debt payments um, into this current fiscal year, which is why we have an additional assessment of $164,000. That assessment is figured based on the percentage of the enrollment in our home districts. So Newton pays a substantially higher percentage than we do. We pay a substantially higher percentage than Carlisle, which is a tiny little district, um, just as a function of enrollment. But that has been in the board of directors um, guidelines for years. So it's a consistent process. We don't yet know beyond operating costs next year about $400,000 of which our assessments roughly 30. We don't yet know what the costs to close are. The low end of the range is $50,000. The high end of the range is probably around $500,000 and that is our cost as a district. Um, right. So it's on the order of, you know, up to five or six million for the entire collaborative to close. Almost the entirety of that is tied up in the lease. Um, and lease obligations because EDCO had a multi-year lease that spanned out another six or seven years beyond what we're going to be able to do. Um, we have provided notice to the um, lessee, lessor that we do not intend to continue the lease past July 31st. We're walking away. We have no appropriation in the budget um, and under 30B procurement guidelines, uh, leases only, you know, any type of uh, contract procured under 30B ends if there's no appropriation in a public entity's budget. We have no appropriation, so we believe we can walk away. There's clearly going to be a process around that that we have to follow, which is why the wide range of potential liability. Um, if it's $50,000, we certainly have the financial flexibility within the operating budget to be able to assume that. If not, in all honesty, we're probably going to have to talk to you about looking at excess and deficiency money to be able to close that gap. So um, we right now, it, I, I think we feel fairly positive that um, we're going to be able to, to have hopefully toward the low end of it, but we just can't promise that. So that's why I'm providing the range. 
The other big area that we're working on with EDCO is um, retiree health insurance after closure. And so we're just working through that process to make sure we can provide, you know, the highest level of coverage for the longest period of time for our retirees. That's a challenge and it's, it's something that's ongoing. So that's, that's it for the EDCO update. But I just want to make sure you know that that's, that's still out there next year. All right, I don't see any questions. So that means Dave can give his report, second report. Okay, thank you. Um, am I muted? No, okay. Uh, just three pieces, one of them's already been presented and that was the um, MTSS uh, discussion. So one down. I gave you some information about cherry sheet updates. The Senate, the Senate has passed its budget proposal. There are a few differences between the House's budget and both, both of the legislative bodies were, were higher than the governor's budget. It's going to conference committee. This is, this is sort of typical. We expect a final uh, report sometime in June. And it was just there as an FYI, just to keep you posted that things are happening at the state and um, certainly nothing earth shattering as far as the uh, changes. I'll say that the just reading some information that came through Mars, the, the re regional school organization, uh, that the state is collecting taxes at a rate higher than it had expected to do. So it appears some uh, surprisingly good economic news at the state level and to the extent that flows down to the local level, I guess remains to be seen. And um, I don't know because it's been a long time since since uh, the last meeting I attended whether the committee knows that the USDA extended universal free lunch through the next school year. And so students at Acton Boxborough, regardless of financial situation, which is which is backwards, meaning uh, they do not need to qualify as low income, every student who enters the building will be able to eat school lunch for free. Uh, the program staff and I are hopeful that it will cause us to rebound economically the program that's taken, as you know, a hit for the last couple of years. So that's just some uh, big picture information. And the last thing is just re with regard to COVID grant activity. I gave you a two-page spreadsheet um, and about the federal stimulus grants. The first one's an overview on amounts of funding and the different programs fr from which we've, re we've received money and year-to-date spending of those funds. And then the second specifics on what we use the, the funds for, just so, just so you can see the level and types of dollars that we've received from uh, the stimulus programs and their use. We recently, last piece, we recently had a discussion with Acton officials and auditors from both the district and the town. We expect that Acton is going to send funds to the district from its first CARES Act allocation. So that'll be good to get that one wrapped up. Thank you, Tessa. You're welcome, Dave. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. What, you have a question? about that? Okay, go ahead. Um, Dave, uh, two questions. You know, you commented that state revenues were favorable. Do you know if that relates to um, taxes that are being paid on capital gains or if there's some other primary reason for that? Um, I do not. And I would expect from, from the text that it does, that it is not, John, because they made a point, this is from State House News, which, which you may or may not have access to yourself. Um, it, it says that it's April collections and with the extension of the tax filing deadline to May, it may not yet capture uh, capital, gains, capital gains taxes. But, it, but that's, just a, that's just conjecture, it doesn't specifically say. Thank you, and then the, the other question that I have is, you know, Obviously, this year, because we moved Acton Town Meeting uh, to later in the year, um, we're actually, you know, looking now at the the, the Senate action, um, and we have a whole different level of.
clarity around the state budget. Um, as you think, you know, back to previous years, um, how much of an advantage is it um, to us in terms of um, the revenue projection and comfort with the revenue projection to have a later town meeting? Asking me, John? Um, where we're, where we don't, where we don't receive a large enrollment driven increase or change in, uh, chapter 70, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. It's great to have information. It's great to know, for example, especially this year, it's really comforting to know that the bottom is not going to fall out. I think at this time last year, Everybody was saying, oh, the next year's budget is going to be really difficult. Well, state tax collections held up. Uh, they they came, th came across with a higher than anticipated transportation reimbursement rate. And so I think, I, I think from the lack of agita among all the different groups, we're in a, we're in a much more comfortable spot. And I think to some degree that's because of the um, ability of the uh, to have this this more information from the state. Okay, um, John, did you want to give a OJ update? Oh, I did actually. Um, the Acton Leadership Group consists of representatives of the town, the school district, and the Acton Finance Committee. The purpose of the ALG is to agree on a balance between revenues and expenses. The ALG plan agreement is by consensus. During last Thursday's ALG meeting, Steve Barrett reported that the debt for the North Acton Fire Station appears to have been double counted, included in both the municipal budget and as a separate debt line item. Um, I believe this has now been confirmed. Um, and that means that the ALG spreadsheet will need to be modified to bring it into balance for town meeting. There are three approaches to updating the ALG plan for Act in Town Meeting to account for the $454,000 change. One is um, we could lower our expected revenue from local receipts. For example, we could you know, project that we're going to get less motor vehicle excise income. The second option um, is to reduce the use of free cash that's in the plan. And the third option is to reduce the, the tax levy. So um, if any school committee member um, would like to comment on their preference uh, so that Amy and I can properly represent the perspective of the school committee at the ALG meeting, now I would love to hear those comments now. Um, if not, Amy and I and, and the administration will be meeting to talk about the pros and cons of various approaches tomorrow. I'll just note that as a Boxborough member in representing the interests of my town, um, because we had, when we were developing our own budget at the district level, there was an understanding that we needed to use the district's E and D in order to cover the shortfall from Acton so that they wouldn't um, supersede their levy limit. And I just want that noted because anything that happens at this point won't reduce, we can't reduce our own usage of E&D because it would increase our budget and that would negatively impact Boxborough. But in future years, as we consider the amount of E&D or free cash that Acton uses in order to um, get us to that number, I just want to note that that Boxborough, you know, did what we did this year, or that we did what we did this year as a district in representing both towns. And, and so, you know, Boxborough's assessment may have been lower this year if we had had this information earlier and been able to not use as much E&D, who knows, I don't know. But I just wanted to note. Duly noted. So if any active members feel strongly, they can reach out to John, given this late evening meeting. All right, um, BLF uh, met, and I don't think that we really have anything to update other than Boxborough Town Meeting is June 12th, and Adam is working on slides. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, we have a consent agenda, right? I'm not skipping anything else. All right, items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion and a separate vote. I will read each item name, and if any member would like it held, please say hold. Approval of meeting minutes of the 
uh, April 15th, 2021 meeting and 5621 workshop. Recommendation to approve a $1,500 grant from Emerson Hospital to RJ Gray Junior High to offset the fruit and vegetable garden project. Recommendation to approve a $2,000 grant from Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation to AB Community Education Summer Day Program. And a recommendation to approve $7,000 grant from AB United Way to AB Community Ed Summer Day Program Scholarships. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve with gratitude. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. That passes unanimously. Adam, do you have a building committee report? I, I do, in fact. Uh, was it Monday this week? Tuesday. Tuesday. It's COVID week. Uh, anyway, Tuesday this week was a momentous occasion for the building project. Um, we had what was called a topping off ceremony where we placed the last steel beam uh, in the structure, uh, which marks the completion of the building of the, the steel structure and the, the work that the iron workers do to assemble that skeleton for us. Uh, Peter uh, got to stand from a fifth grade classroom and oversee all the operations while the rest of us groundlings were in a tent and watched it on a screen. Uh, but it was great to see those beams that uh, many of our preschoolers and Douglas students and Gates students and uh, uh, town officials got to sign as they got placed into the building. Um, and, and with that, the building uh, begins to get turned over to the various trades. So they start to uh, pour more of the cement floors and they start looking at the mechanical and the electrical and the plumbing and, and really start to, to put the building together. Uh, at the front gymnasium, they're starting to put even in some of the, the, the front cement walls um, and facade of the building. So it's, it is really starting to come together as a, as a facility. Um, other updates. That's, that's, that's what sticks at the top of my head. There's um, progress going now with the boardwalk where they're starting to um, take out the existing boardwalk and put in the, the new boardwalk, um, which does mean that access to that boardwalk will be um, cut off through most of the summer, but should be open uh, by early next year. And Peter, are there any other updates that I'm missing? No, I think probably just naming committee. The naming so is there anything committee. on that yeah. front? I don't have anything to say about that okay. <laughs> today. <laughs> so I, that was my question actually, and it's probably more for you. Um, so in the, April four, in the April 14th school building committee minutes, um, su sub number four, it lays out a, a process and the expectation I guess is for this, this school committee to vote in September. So is, is your intention to get this going like quickly and just have a process over the summer? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very, very quickly. Okay, I will, ha I will read the uh, motion thing for you two because I already have it ready. All right, I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll warrants as follows. Number P2122 dated 4-22-21-2021 in the amount of $2,530,250.63. Number P2123, P2123T dated 5-6-2021 20, in the amount of $2,695,156.33. Payroll deduction warrants as follows. Number 21-022PR dated 4-22-2021 in the amount of $1,130,380.85. Number 21-023PR dated 5-6-2021 in the amount of $548,000. $404.50. Vendor warrants as follows. Number 21 021, dated 415 2021, in the amount of $1,160,268.67. Number 21 022, dated 429 2021, in the amount of $1,531,360.69. And number 21 023, dated 513 2021, in the amount of $1,000,000. $688,175.38. Is there? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. That passes unanimously. Is there anything, Peter, that you'd like to highlight in the FYI? I think we're all set for tonight. Okay. Not even the mask thing. 
We already talked about that. Oh, we already that. did talk about that. Okay, great. Is there a motion to adjourn? Who just said Tessa? What? Oh, okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed?